starting off this countdown, we have Thomas W. Lawson. Thomas W. Lawson was a British stockbroker who in 1907 published a book called Friday the 13th. The story was about a stockbroker who tried to make the entire stock market crash on Friday the 13th, hence the name of the book. Little did he know that he would eerily predict the future. On Friday, December 13th of 1907, a ship named Thomas W. Lawson, named after a completely different Thomas W. Lawson, not the author, set sail on her first transatlantic voyage. That day, she sank. Isn't that bizarre? A ship named Thomas W. Lawson crashed and sunk on Friday the 13th. I'm telling you, this guy predicted the future whether he meant to or not. Moving on to number nine, we have the start and end of America's Civil War. In July of 1861, Wilmer McLean's Virginia home was involved in the first battle of Bull Run. In fact, the general of the battle wrote a diary entry about a cannonball crashing through McLean's kitchen. He wrote, and I quote, a federal shell fell into the fireplace of my headquarters at the McLean house. Now, due to safety reasons, McLean moved his family home from the front lines to to a new home in Appomattox County. Well, guess what? The battle ended up ending in his parlor in 1865. So it started in his backyard and ended in his parlor. So he was involved in the beginning and the end. Moving on to number eight, we have the birth chart. This story was shared by Raina Lee R on Reddit. So according to her, her brother's doctor would always get his chart mixed up at the office. And that's because there was another kid under his care with the same first and last name. To make things weirder, they were both born on the same day, just different months of the same year. And their mothers had the same name. What are the odds of that? I'll be saying that a lot in this video, so get used to it. But for someone to have the same first and last name as you, it's absolutely wild. And the same doctor. I just hope that they met and became best friends. Coming in at number seven, we have The Marks. This story was shared by pata 95 Nishta on Reddit. And this story is about to blow your mind. So according to her, her best friend from elementary school has three sisters. All three sisters grew up to marry engineers. Not only that, but all of their husbands were named Mark. And her best friend, I guess, followed this tradition because when she got older, she also married an engineer named Mark. What are the odds that all husbands' names were Mark and all of them are engineers? This is wild to me. Like, did the sisters do that on purpose? Are all engineers just named Mark? Also, that must be so confusing at family get-togethers and dinners. In our sixth spot, we have the meteor. So it's said that the odds of being hit by a meteor is one in 840 million. So the odds of this happening are very, very, very slim. It's next to impossible. Well, the impossible happened to a family in France. One night they were hit by a meteor, which had been flying through space for more than four and a half billion years without hitting a target. Then all of a sudden it just crashed into their home. Thankfully, no one was hurt. The odd part here is that the family's last name was Comet. So out of all families and homes to hit, it hit the family with the name Comet. That is truly bizarre. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Anthony Hopkins. In the early 1970s, Anthony Hopkins was casted to play Koista in The Girl from Petrovka. This film was based on the book of the same name. Now, to prepare for the role, he was going to read the book. However, he was unable to find any copy of the book in any bookstore. He searched all over the place, but to no avail. Then, randomly one day, as he was sitting in the London tube station, he found a copy of that book just laying around. Not only that, but when he opened the book, he found that it was signed by its author. Literally, the universe brought him what he was looking for. What are the odds of someone leaving that book behind and then Anthony finding it? The very book he was desperately looking for. Coming in at number four, we have The Close Calls. In 2014, Dutch cyclist Martin de Jong had plans to head from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur. He was scheduled to be on Malaysia Airlines Flight 17. But before his flight, he bumped his ticket up to catch a later flight because it was cheaper. That is the airline that was shot down while flying over eastern Ukraine. All passengers lost their lives. That's not all. In March, he had a flight from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing. Again, he decided to bump his ticket up at the last minute to get a cheaper deal. And it's a good thing that he did. He was scheduled to be on Malaysia Airlines Flight 370, the one that disappeared, never to be seen again. So Martin escaped death twice, all because he wanted a better deal and saved some money. 
he's a lucky, lucky man, but also unlucky that he was supposed to be on both of those flights. In our third spot, we have the plum pudding. Mathematician Joseph Mazur shared this creepy coincidence involving French poet Emile de Champs with plum pudding in his book, Luke. So back in the day, a man named Emile was first introduced to plum pudding by a man named Mr. de Forgebu. From that moment on, every time he had plum pudding, he would encounter Mr. de Forgebu, and I hope I'm saying his name right. The second time he had plum pudding, he was at a restaurant and ordered it. But the waiter was like, sorry, we just sold the last pudding to this man and points to the back of the restaurant. Lo and behold, it was Mr. DeForgeabu. A decade later, he went to a dinner party and at the party, they were serving plum pudding. Emil made a joke like, who's this party for, Mr. DeForgeabu? And at that very moment, he walked through the door. But he wasn't even supposed to be at that party. He had accidentally come to the wrong door on his way to another dinner party. So what are the odds that every time that this man had plum pudding, Mr. DeForgeabu was there? It's kind of like Beetlejuice, you know, you say his name three times and he'll appear, except in this case, you have plum pudding and he'll appear. Moving on to number two, we have flight 666. Now this one gives me the absolute creeps. On Friday the 13th, flight 666 departed from Copenhagen and landed in Helsinki, AKA H-E-L, hell. Let me say that again for you. Flight 666 flew to hell on Friday the 13th. I don't know about you, but if I was scheduled on that flight, I would cancel immediately. I ain't taking no chances. But thankfully, the flight landed safely in Helsinki. Thank gosh it did because that seems like one cursed flight. It's plain creepy how it lined up exactly like that. Pun intended, get it, plain creepy? And in our number one spot today, we have the prediction of James Dean's death. On September 30th, 1955, James Dean died in a car accident. He was only 24 years old. And it seems like a man named Alec Guinness actually predicted this would happen. He warned Dean and said, and I quote, if you get in that car, you will be found dead in it by this time next week. A week later, Dean was involved in a terrible car accident and he sadly lost his life. In fact, Alec had said that the car was sinister, and I think he's right. Later, parts of the car were recovered and resold and placed into other cars. All the car owners who had parts of James Dean's car were also involved in deadly crashes. Not only that, but the mechanic working on the car died after the car rolled off the back of a truck and crushed the legs of the mechanic. So Alec was onto something here and tried to warn Dean. Starting off this countdown, we have the married couple's parents. This story surrounds a couple named Stephen and Helen Lee. A couple of years ago, the pair got engaged when they learned something very freaky about their families. While going through family photos during their engagement party, they found photos of their parents together. Turns out that Stephen's father and Helen's mom had actually dated and were set to get married in Korea in the 1960s. But their parents' parents disapproved, so they they didn't. Had they not disapproved, the couple would have never been born. Not only that, but what are the odds that they got together after their parents had already gotten together? Kind of awkward if you ask me. Moving on to number nine, we have the church fire. On March 1st of 1950 at 7.25 p.m., a church exploded in Beatrice, Nebraska. At 7.20, a choir practice had begun, except none of the 15 choir members were there. And it's lucky that they weren't or else they would have perished in the fire. Turns out that all 15 members arrived late due to personal reasons. So they were nowhere near the church when it exploded. What are the odds that all 15 members were running late? This story could have ended in tragedy. Thankfully, it didn't. Moving on to number eight, we have the wedding vows. In 2007, Fred and Lynette Dubendorf were walking along a beach clearing up some litter when they found a message in a bottle. After they opened it, they found it contained the marriage vows of another couple. Upon closer inspection, they found that their marriage dates matched. The couple who created the vows in the bottle were married on August 18th of that year. The Dubendorfs were married August 18th of 1979. Both couples were also married on beaches. The Dubendorf were in complete shock and actually reached out to the other couple. Thankfully, the couple left their address in the bottle. 
Both couples now believe that their marriages were meant to be. Especially Matt and Melody, the couple that wrote the vows in a bottle, who had several failed marriages before finding each other. They were skeptical about getting married again, but this to them is a sign that it was meant to be. Moving on to number seven, we have Edgar Allan Poe. This is one of the freakiest coincidences I have ever read about. So in 1838, Edgar Allan Poe wrote his only complete novel. It was called The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket. The book was about Arthur Pym who goes on a nautical adventure. He hops on a boat as a stowaway and hides out there. But while aboard the ship, a mutiny occurs and a number of crew members lose their life. There's only four members aboard the ship now. One of the men was named Richard Parker. They kept him alive to help them control the ship. However, they encountered a terrible, terrible storm and things went south. The remaining four people on board are struggling to find food. So Richard was like, let's draw straws. Whoever gets the shortest straw will be killed and the others can eat them. So they did as Richard said, and he ended up drawing the shortest straw and then was eaten by his crew members. Believe it or not, but 46 years after that book was published, this happened in real life. In May of 1884, four men were traveling from England to Australia when they found themselves fighting for their lives. The men decided to draw straws and see who they should eat. The cabin boy drew the smallest straw. What was the cabin's boy's name? Richard Parker the same name as the guy who got eaten in the book. What are the odds of that? Is Edgar Allan Poe a psychic or did he write history or both? Moving on to number six, we have Redbox. This story comes from Madney25 on Reddit. A couple of years ago, her and her friend went to Redbox to see if they could rent the movie Tron. For those of you who don't know what Redbox is, basically it's an American video rental company that has these little kiosks you can go to and pick what movie you want and then you can rent it and you'll get the DVD. So they went there, but they found out that they didn't have Tron. So they were like, okay, screw it, let's just rent another movie. Well, when they opened up the DVD case, turns out that inside was the movie Tron. Someone had put it back in the wrong case. But what are the odds? Because that's the movie that they wanted to see in the first place. Like out of all the DVDs they could have gotten, they got the one with the switched disc. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the lucky numbers. So this story comes from Yamaletf on Reddit. According to them, they were working as a call center operator when they asked the caller for her birthday. The caller said it was April 20th, which was the same birthday as the operator. When the next caller rang in, their birthday was April 27th, which was the same birthday as the operator's brothers. So at this point, the operator was like, okay, what is going on? And then the caller told her that maybe it's a sign and that she should go play the lottery with those dates. And that night she went to the grocery store, played with those numbers and ended up winning. It was only $380, but still that's better than nothing. What are the odds that the winning numbers correlated to the caller's birthdays? In our fourth spot, we have the birthdays. According to a woman named Carrie Lee Simmons, her and her best friend share a number of eerie similarities. First, they both have the same birthdays. Not only that, but turns out that they were born in the same hospital and their mothers shared the same recovery room. Keep in mind that their mothers were complete strangers. Then 17 years later, the two connected and became best friends. When they found out that they were practically born beside each other, they completely freaked out. That's how you know that friendship is meant to be. In our third spot, we have the sign. This next story is from Reddit user EricFP23. So the day in which her grandfather died, her mother had been sitting in bed next to him, comforting him. Before he passed, she whispered to him, tell Richie I say hi. Richie was her ex-husband who had passed away a couple years earlier. A couple of days after her grandfather's passing, Erica and her mom were at Walgreens when all of a sudden a huge truck drove by with some writing written on the side of it. It read, Richie says hi. I am speechless, like that's just goosebumps. And Erica and her mom were speechless too. It's either just a super eerie coincidence or Richie sent that message from the grave. Moving on to number two, we have the taxi driver. I'm sorry, but this one is a little depressing compared to the other stories on today's list. In 1974, a man was riding his moped scooter in Bermuda when he was struck and killed by a taxi. One year later, his twin brother was riding the exact same scooter when he was struck and killed by a taxi as well. The taxi was driven by the exact same driver who took his brother's life. So not only did the twins die the exact same way, but they had been killed by the exact same person. 
And in our number one spot today, we have the life savior. When Su Wei Fong of China was 50 years old, he was outside near a river by his home when he saw a boy drowning. So he jumped in and saved his life. 30 years later, he rescued another boy from the river. This boy had slipped and fell into the river and didn't know how to swim. Once again, Wei Fong jumped in and saved this boy's life. Well, turns out that the two people he saved were related. They were father and son. 30 years ago, he saved the boy's father from drowning. Then he saved the father's son from drowning in the same river. So they believe that this man is their guardian angel. All right, guys, that's all for today's video. Which one of these coincidences creeped you out the most? They're all pretty eerie in their own way, if you ask me. Starting off this countdown, we have Jean-Marie Duberry. On February 13th, 1746, a French man named Jean-Marie was executed for the murder of his father. Hundreds of years later, on the exact same day, a man named Jean-Marie Duberry was also sentenced to death. He had also taken the life of his father. So what are the odds that two unrelated people with the same name both killed their fathers and then got executed on the same day? Like that is just way too freaky. In our ninth spot, we have the dollar bill. Now this is a pretty wholesome one for you all. When a woman named Esther was young, she had written her name on a couple of dollar bills after a bad breakup. She then told herself that she was going to marry the man that brought the bill back to her. Well, years later, she was dating a man named Paul Gratchen. The day he asked Esther to be his girlfriend, they were at a sandwich shop. As he was paying for the meal, he got handed a dollar bill with the name Esther written on it. The bill she wrote years prior. And in the end, they ended up getting married. Now, how wholesome is that? The universe literally gave her what she had manifested. Coming in at number eight, we have the girls with the red balloon. In 2001, a 10 year old girl named Laura Buxton decided to release a red balloon from her front yard with a message on it. The balloon said, please return to Laura Buxton and it had her address written on it. Well, this balloon traveled 140 miles and ended up landing on the yard of another 10 year old girl's house. This girl's name was also Laura Buxton. Like what are the odds? The two Laura Buxtons ended up meeting and they discovered that they had tons of similarities, not just their age and name. For example, they both had a guinea pig, a gray rabbit, and a three-year-old chocolate lab. They both also looked alike and dressed alike. I'm telling you, this is just way too freaky. Like, what are the odds? I'm gonna be saying that a lot in this video. What are the odds? Moving on to number seven, we have Mark Twain and Haley's Comet. Every 76 years, Haley's Comet is visible to the naked eye as it soars past Earth. Well, American writer Mark Twain was born on one of Haley's Comet's passing in 1835. The next year that the comet was said to pass was in 1910, and Mark Twain predicted that he was going to die that year. He said that he came into the world with the comet and that he was going to leave the world with the comet as well. And Mark Twain was right. Mark Twain passed one day after the comet's closest approach in 1910. So not only did Mark Twain predict his own death, but his birth and death both seamlessly lined up with Halley's comet. How freaky. In our sixth spot, we have Violet Jessup. Violet Jessup has been named the luckiest woman as well as the unluckiest woman. She also has been given the name Miss Unsinkable, and I'll explain how she got those nicknames in just a second. So Violet was a stewardess and nurse who was on board three big sister ships when disaster struck each of them. It started with the HMS Olympic. She was on board the ship when it collided with the HMS Hawk. Then she was on the HMHS Britannic when it struck a mine at sea. And lastly, she was on board the Titanic and she managed to escape all three of these disasters. At this point, she probably was cursed. And after the first accident, she shouldn't have gotten back on any ships ever again. So that's why she's been given the name, the luckiest, unluckiest woman to live. She's been lucky to survive all the accidents, but unlucky that they kept happening to her. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with Danielle Dutoit. The irony behind this next story is mind blowing. So Danielle Dutoit was a South African astronomer. Over his life, he discovered and co-discovered several comets. He also spent his days giving lectures. On September 28th, 1981, he gave a lecture on how death can strike anyone at any time. As soon as the lecture was done, he popped a mint into his mouth. 
The mint then slid to the back of his throat, he choked on it and died right then and there. So yeah, I'd say his lecture was pretty spot on. In our fourth spot today, we have Harry Zigland. Now, this story is kind of controversial. Some say it's an old wives' tale. Others say that it actually did happen. Now, if it did happen, then this is the definition of karma. So back in the day, there was a man named Harry Zigland who broke a woman's heart. She was so heartbroken that she took her own life. Her brother was so devastated and angry at Harry that he vowed to get revenge on him. So he went out to find Harry with his gun and shot at him. Harry fell to the floor and the brother, thinking that he had succeeded in killing him, grabbed his gun and took his own life. But Harry survived. The bullet didn't strike him. Instead, it hit and got lodged into a nearby tree. Three years later, Henry was using dynamite to remove the tree. When he blew it up, the explosion sent the bullet out of the tree and it hit and instantly killed him. It took Karma three years, but it finally caught up to him. Coming in at number three, we have the Hoover Dam. Over the course of the construction of the Hoover Dam, there were 96 deaths. The first death was of a man named J.G. or George Turney. It occurred on December 20th, 1922. He sadly lost his life after drowning in the dam. 14 years later, on the exact anniversary of this guy's death, his son, Patrick Turney, lost his life. He fell from an electrical tower and died. This was also the final death reported during the construction of the dam meaning the first man to die and the last man were father and son, and it happened on the exact same day. Coming in at number two, we have Jack Frost and other stories. Some things are just meant to be, and you'll believe this once you hear this next story. Children's book author Anne Parrish was with her husband in Paris when they stopped by an antique bookshop from the 1920s. While in there, she found a copy of Jack Frost and other stories. She told her husband that that was her favorite book as a child. Well, when he opened the book, it had her name written inside of it. It read Anne Parrish, 209N Weber Street, Colorado Springs. So not only did it have Anne's name in the book, but it had the place she grew up in, Colorado Springs. Seems like Anne was meant to find that book. And in our number one spot today, we have the two presidents. It turns out that Abraham Lincoln and John F. Kennedy share a lot of eerie coincidences. Besides the fact that they both were American presidents, they both were killed by a gunshot wound to the back of the head, they both passed away on a Friday, they both died before a celebration, Kennedy was assassinated on the eve of Thanksgiving, Lincoln died right before Easter, and each were accompanied by their wife and another couple when they were killed. But that's not all. They both had best friends named Billy Graham, both Billies had four children, and they both had secretaries named after the other president. Kennedy's secretary was Miss Lincoln, Lincoln's secretary was John. But wait, there's even more. Both of their successors were vice presidents called Johnson. The freakiest coincidence, Lincoln was shot in Ford's theater. Kennedy was shot in a Lincoln made by Ford. Whoa, boom, mic drop. Isn't that insane? I thought so, it blew my mind. Number 10, twins named Jim. Okay, we'll kick this part two off on a lighter note. This one gets a little dark, so we'll ease our way in, you know? The twins named Jim. Okay, that sounds like a 2026 comedy hit already. Back in 1979, a set of twins were reunited when they were 39 years old at the time. This was of course a big moment in their lives. For 37 years, they barely knew of each other's existence. Then when they finally met, the long lost twins had more in common than they could have ever thought. For starters, both had been named Jim. I spoiled that in the fun title earlier. But their adoptive parents both named the lads Jim. That's insane. Jim? Like of all names? Really? And both Jims just happened to love math and carpentry. Both also had jobs and security. And both also had ex-wives named Linda. And they both since married a woman named Betty. This isn't, this isn't like, what? Imagine meeting another you, and he's like, oh yeah, I also love knitting and Autobots. What are the odds? No, that's too eerie. You're an alien clone. Something's afoot here. Get out of here. Not just meeting a long lost twin at 40. No way. Number nine, Stephen Hawking's. Time is relative and fascinating and all that confusing stuff. There's so many components of our universe that we still don't even understand. James Webb is out here making people turn to atheists all of a sudden. The universe is bigger than we all think, yet somehow it still gives us these once in a lifetime coincidences. Or as I say, <laughs> Stephen Hawking's death occurred on Einstein's 139th birthday, which is also Galileo's 300th death day, and also Pi Day. 
This was March 14th. My dad has the same birthday as Daniel Radcliffe and they're both wizards, so I don't know. Just saying, these birthday coincidences are getting out of hand. Coincidences, coincidences, coincidences. There it is, he's got it. Number eight, Atomic Survivor. On August 6th and 9th, 1945, the United States detonated two nuclear explosives over the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This, of course, was devastating. The results in this reaction, the blast and the radiation they both caused, took the lives of nearly 90,000 people. It was horrible. But in 2009, the Japanese government confirms that there was at least one man who was in each city on both both days of the reactions, and he lived to tell the tale. On August 6th, Satamu Yamaguchi was in Hiroshima on a business trip. As I was walking alone, I heard the sound of a plane, just one, he told a British newspaper. I looked up into the sky and I saw the B-29 and it dropped two parachutes. I was looking up into the sky at them and suddenly it was like a flash of magnesium, a great flash in the sky, and I was blown over just like that. And by August 9th, he had returned home to Nagasaki only to experience the trauma for a second time. Despite the double radiation exposure, Yamaguchi lived to be 93 years old, which is incredible. He sadly passed away from stomach cancer. Number seven, Julianne Kopka. Miss Julianne has a two for one when it comes to survival stories. I had to include it. Her story starts out on Christmas Eve, a lovely day, 1971, when she was just a teenager and she was on Lanza Flight 508. Now the plane was struck by lightning, which is an actual nightmare situation that I didn't know could happen. And this led to the plane starting to disintegrate midair. I don't even, yeah. It was all bad. In what felt like the blink of an eye for Julianne, she found herself still strapped to her seat two miles above the Peruvian rainforest. She was injured, of course, full of bruises, a broken collarbone, but she was alive after she landed. And in fact, she was the only person who had been on the flight that was still alive. Just fell out of a plane and lived to tell. That is crazy. That is bad insane. But it's like you're out of the fire into the frying pan at this point, right? Now you're in the wilderness all alone with no food. Just, you know, a little bit of candy, if anything, from the plane. Julianne had found a small stream which she began to wade in downstream. She traveled along it. And the insects in the jungle were eating her alive. And sorry, this next part is gross, but maggots had infected her arm. It was like bad, worse, even worse. Now we're flowing down a river and maggots are eating me. Uh, this is incredible. Julianne ended up coming across a sort of encampment where she found a few supplies and she was so smart and was able to give herself a little bit of first aid, which included pouring gasoline on the infected arm, which then led to all the you know disgusting bugs and maggots leaving it. Because they're like, hey, I'm not a fan of gasoline. Lunch is over. See you later. And then just a few hours later, a few lumber workers found her. And they gave her more first aid treatment and took her to an area that was more populated, where she was then airlifted for medical treatment. Now, in 2000, her story was told through the documentary titled Wings of Hope, which was directed by Werner Herzog, who particularly took interest in the story because, one, it's obviously incredible as I was just explaining it. I read this and I'm like, it's crazy. But two, Werner Herzog also had a seat booked on that flight and he would have been on that same flight if it wasn't for a last minute change of plans. I can't even, that should be number one, really. Number six, Comet family. Okay, this one's good. The odds of being hit or killed by a meteor are one in two million or something like that, right? It's crazy. But even so, back in 1954, residents in Talladega County, Alabama, noticed a ball of fire heading towards the earth. Now, back then we didn't have Twitter, right? We couldn't warn anybody that a meteor was possibly gonna hit us. We also really didn't know if it was gonna hit or not or how big it was, so it was alarming. Especially for Anne Elizabeth Hodges, who got hit by said space rock. Yeah, she only got grazed, but with these odds, it's still possible, wild. Now cut to recent history, the Comet family in France. Their house was hit by a meteor. I'll say that again, the Comet family was hit by a you get it, there we go. As somebody with the last name McWaters, I'm a little worried that I might drown now. I don't know, last names seem to be a little bit of a tip off, it seems. And number five, World Cup. An episode from The Simpsons back in 1997 called The Cartridge Family shows Mexico and Portugal going head to head in football. Like, you know, like soccer football, not like, you know, football, football, you get it. Springfield residents are told to go see this match to determine which nation is the greatest on earth, Mexico or Portugal. So when the 2018 World Cup then rolled around much later, rolled around, pun intended, fans were excited that this was now coming true, but at the same time had a laugh determining that Ronaldo must have missed that penalty intentionally so that the prediction would come true. That's like the theory now that Ronaldo missed to make the Simpsons correct. A lot of theories for that one, it's always fun. But recently it's been announced that Qatar will host a tournament in November and December 2022, rather than usual June, July dates. Another World Cup, another chance for the Simpsons to add another prediction to their already impressive list. That's a creepy show. I have another Simpsons one coming up, but we'll see. Number four, Mars Life. 
Eh, we're back, there it is. There's the next Simpson one, that, that fast, there we go. Let me ask you lovely people a question. If you could go to Mars right now with like three of your friends, would you do it? Keep in mind it's really boring, and unless you're a astronaut botanist like Matt Damon, you'll probably have a rough go. But in the future, would you do it? I would, I'd go. I'd go with like one person, you know? Forced too many, that's too much. Going to Mars might be as simple as going to the mall. Apparently, the Simpsons have an episode where they show a family visit to the big red planet come 2051. But honestly, I feel like we're gonna get there a lot sooner. SpaceX is already planning to send people out there. It's a quick, you know, nine month trip, so make sure your phone's charged. But it's actually more beneficial for the team to travel during these peak times, in the 2030s and in the 2050s. Because during these years, trips to the planet will be shorter and they'll coincide with periods of the solar maximum. So, while this one may or may not come true in 2022, well, let me tell you, it's right around the corner. Or maybe in 2050. Who knows? Number three, Titanic inspection card. This inspection card once belonged to a woman named Marion Meanwell. And you're probably thinking, eh, what could possibly be worrisome or, you know, creepy about an inspection card? Well, it shows how Marion was not intended to be on the Titanic that fateful day, but by some turn of events, she unfortunately found herself as one of the passengers. The card shows that she was originally meant to be traveling on a ship called the Majestic, and for some reason, the trip she originally had planned was delayed, and now she instead was assigned to the ill-fated Titanic. The eerie part is, you can see the word majestic was crossed out on her card, which then shows us the change in plans. If only people were able to see what was about to strike and they could have somehow warned her. That's the creepy thing about these coincidences. Sometimes they're just bad, you know? You could fall out of a plane and have maggots all over you and survive, or you could go from one cursed ship to another. Ah, number two, Edgar Allan Poe. Okay, this is a story that actually convinced me that Edgar Allan Poe is for real a time traveler, so buckle up, grab a soda. Because two separate stories that he wrote both turned out to be exceptionally true and real, but not until after they'd been written. Yeah, it's a good one. Firstly, Poe's only completed novel was published in 1838, and it tells the tale of mutiny on a whaling ship lost at sea. These men on a ship realize that they're doomed and need to resort to extreme measures in order to stay alive. So they begin drawing straws to see who they're going to sacrifice to save food. A boy named Richard Parker drew the shortest straw and therefore became the next meal. Dark, let's move on. Let's fast forward to 46 years now to 1884, and in real life also, I might add. There are now four men who have been set adrift after the sinking of a yacht. These men found themselves in a similar predicament to the novels, and I kid you not, they ended up taking the same route and elected to sacrifice a cabin boy. A cabin boy also named Richard Parker. Odd, right? Okay. Cut to 1840, Poe penned the gruesome story, The Businessman, in which the narrator suffers a traumatic head injury in his youth, and then later a violent life follows. The weird thing about this story is that Edgar Allan Poe fully understood, or so it seemed, frontal lobe injury. Now this was long before it was ever even studied or looked at, right? This this type of study didn't arrive until 1848. An actual neurologist, Eric Altschuler, recently wrote how there's a dozen symptoms and he knew every single one. It's so exact and it's so weird, it's like he had a time machine, end quote. Yeah, it's almost like he had a time machine. Did he? And finally, number one, Simpsons dome in real life. Yep, this one's gonna hit home, let's do it. This one's gonna hit dome. That didn't work. For this one, we're looking at the Simpsons movie, which still holds up. That's a fun time. But even over the pandemic, I saw personal domes come to life, right? It was so weird. Restaurants were making these like weird tents on sidewalks just to stay in business. But an even bigger idea came long before this. Back in the 70s, there were talks about putting a dome over Manhattan, this massive dome over Midtown that regulates weather and pollution, all that good stuff. Now, if that had been built, imagine what we would have done with it during the initial breakout during this pandemic. It would have been madness. And then in 2010, later on, the city called Eco City 2020 was planned out. It was supposed to be built in Siberia. It was announced in 2014 officially, this climate controlled, you know, domed city, four and a half square kilometers, all that good stuff. But since 2016, the project lost the funding. What do you guys think? Should we bring back domes and just, you know, have a, a little personal bubble everywhere we go? Just lose the umbrella and live in a big glass ball forever over our city? I'd do it, that'd be kinda nice. Be like living in a Coca-Cola mist zone your entire life, just kinda like, ooh, this is nice. Kick you off the list at number 10, the Hoover Dam coincidence. We'll kick this list off on a grim note, because why not? The Hoover Dam, okay, this massive accomplishment. Its first victim, sadly, was a man named J.G. Tierney. It was December 20th, 1922, and the official death toll from industrial accidents during the construction of the dam from 1921 to 1935 was sadly around the 200 number. It was a lot of deaths, so it was pretty sad. The earliest and latest victims of the construction were both father and son. 
And if that's not coincidence enough, both of them died on the exact same day. They both passed on December 20th. JG Tierney sadly drowned while conducting surveys in the Colorado River, and then 13 years later, Patrick Tierney fell off an intake tower right before construction was complete. Grim start, but Stay tuned, we have a lot more. Number nine, legendary musical neighbors. It's weird how similar some of your neighbors are, right? Like growing up, we had three Davids on our street. They all loved cutting their lawn at 7 a.m. What a coincidence, right? We all hated them. What a coincidence. While the 60s rock icon, Jimi Hendrix, and the 18th century composer, George Frederick Handel, they were both neighbors. A couple hundred years apart, but they were both neighbors indeed. They lived in 23 Brook Street and 25 Brook Street in London. What are the odds, right? Had George had been born 200 years later, we would have gotten the greatest collab of all time. Yeah, if you're a local, of course you'll know there's a site there now, it's a famous landmark, but in terms of coincidences, there's music in the air on Brock Street, something's going on. Kinda wanna walk by and see if I'm better at playing the, playing the flute. Maybe I can play the flute on that block, who knows. Number eight, same taxi, different tragedy. Okay, here's a dark one, buckle up folks. Pun intended. Back in 1975, a man was sadly hit by a taxi in Bermuda. Now, he of course sadly did not make it. All the while, a passenger in the taxi witnessed the entire horrible event. Now, that's life changing in itself. That's trauma, right? A year later, though, the same driver was driving the same passenger when all of a sudden, the taxi hits another civilian. That civilian just happened to be the initial victim's brother. Ugh, horrible. This is some Final Destination stuff. I don't like it at all. Like this, what are the odds here? Really? Let's move on to something a bit nicer, a bit. Number seven, same day, different vows. Okay, brightening up the mood a little bit, bringing us all back to happy land. CBC News reported this one. It's a little nicer of an ending. Fred and Lynette Dubendorf, husband and wife, they were taking a stroll down the beach with their dog, living up the life, right? The classic. When they noticed a message in a bottle had washed up on the shore. Now, personally, I wouldn't be too excited, right? I'd be a little concerned. I've seen cast away, you know? This message could go one of two ways. I have no idea. Like, what's gonna be in here, right? Like, help, 1876, you're like, oh no. But they opened it, and inside they found wedding vows from another couple, Melody Kloska and Matt Bears. They had recently got married on a beach in Lake Michigan, and word spread rather quickly. Thing is, their wedding date was the same as the couple who found the message. That was the bizarre coincidence here. So they took it as a sign that both pairs were meant to be, and they sent a surprising letter to the lost couple's address. It's kinda nice, but it's also kinda creepy, you know? It'd be creepy on one hand. Hey, I found that message in a bottle. Cool, nice address, lovely home. Cool, I'll be back in a bit, hope it works out. Who puts their address on a message? That's just asking for disaster. Number six, one dollar marriage. The story of Esther and Paul Gratchen. Okay, this one goes out to all the single folks out there, okay? Keep hanging on. Love's coming, it's out there. See, Paul had decided on asking Esther to marry him, and around the same time, he caught himself about to spend a $1 bill on a sandwich. But the dollar bill randomly had the name Esther on it. Okay, so he framed it. Obviously, this was a bizarre coincidence, and Paul recognized this. And when he showed Esther later, she was speechless, right? She loved it, but she didn't tell Paul her side of the story until after they tied the knot. See, much earlier, when Esther and a group of friends were all going through a breakup, they wrote their names on a dollar bill and said, whoever brings this bill back to them, they'll marry that man. Now Esther didn't tell Paul the full story until after they got married because, well, she was worried this coincidence would have scared him away. Yeah, more than fair. Hey, I have a dollar bill and it's your name on it, so we have to get married now. you are like, what? Bye. Number five, Civil War coincidence. There's another war coincidence in this list, but I saved that for number one, because it's too good. But this one here is also pretty insane. The Civil War began in 1861 with the first battle of Bull Run. The Bull Run is a stream that passes through the farm of a 46 year old Wilmer McLean. Passes through his farm, right? The Bull Run is a stream that passes through the farm of a 46 year old Wilmer McLean. This property was in Virginia. Now, of course, once the dust settled, the property was destroyed. So McLean left his home with his wife. And for nearly four years, the pair were considered safe while the war was otherwise changing history. Then in 1865, the war came to a close when Robert E. Lee surrendered to Ulysses S. Grant at the Apotomax Courthouse, which at the time was literally steps away from McLean's new property. Yeah, he saw the beginning and the end of the Civil War by accident. He saw it front row too, what are the odds? Number four, George D. Bryson. Back in the 50s, this story was spread all over Kentucky. Back in the 50s in Louisville, a man named George D. Bryson was checking into a hotel room. Now he walked up and asked if there was any mail for him, which on one hand is an excellent bit. I'm gonna do that next time I go to a hotel for sure. Hey, got any mail? Classic, cause you're just visiting the one time. There's no way there's gonna be mail. That's the joke, right? Except this time there was. This time the hotel manager said, Yes, and there was in fact mail from the previous occupant of the room who had also had the same name, George D. Bryson. Yeah, 
What are the odds, right? I remember one time I met another McWaters and he was not related to me. And he also was not thrilled that we had the same name at all. It was the most bizarre thing. I was like, hey, can we talk about this? He's like, yeah, cool. I'm like, are you my brother? Let's, I don't want you to be anymore. Get out of here. Then I got Kyle and I was like, you know what? Change your name. Now you're my new brother. Replace this guy. Number three, Yanni and Laurel. Before we wrap up this curious list, we have to throw a fun recent one in as well. Remember this Yanni Laurel thing back in 2018? I only heard Yanni for like two weeks straight. I heard Yanni. That's it. For two weeks, guaranteed. I was determined that it was Yanni, okay? And then one day I listened and it was Laurel. And then I couldn't go back. It was just Laurel all of a sudden. Like it immediately just changed. It was a completely different word. I felt sick. I was like, is this real life? How is this happening? This got everybody talking. What is this phenomenon that happens? Same with the dress mishap. What is going on? Well, many believe these viral illusions are proof that we're living in a simulation. Yeah, these arguments, you know, the dress is blue, no, it's white. These situations prove that we perceive reality in our own individual way. Everybody is living an individual perceived reality. So sometimes it doesn't always align. Sometimes we hear what we want to hear. Sometimes we hear Zami, and then sometimes we hear Laurel, and it's completely different for some reason. I can't go back now, it's the worst. God, I hated this so much. The dress was back in 2015, then Yanni Laurel was 2018. I don't know, we're due for another glitch in the matrix any day now. I come back next week, I have a different first name all of a sudden, you're like, what? Number two, Miss Unsinkable. It's one thing to narrowly miss a natural disaster or a massive accident, but to not miss a tragedy three times in a row, that sounds like a curse, if you ask me. That's for sure a curse. Violet Jessup, this brave soul, survived three major ship disasters in history. She was born in 1887 in Argentina, and Jessup contracted tuberculosis at a young age and wasn't expected to live longer than a few months. She beat those odds and lived a healthy, relatively long life, which is shocking considering what I'm about to tell you. Violet, first of all, had a hard time getting hired as a stewardess on a ship because her youth and good looks were feared to distract crew and passengers. Yeah, you're too good looking to work on a ship. Welcome to the 1900s, I guess. Eventually, she got hired in 1910 to work aboard the HMS Olympic. Now, a year later, the Olympic collided with HMS Hawk and the ship barely made it to shore. It was a tragedy, it was a huge disaster. Violet then served as a nurse aboard the Britannic right before World War I. The ship then collided with a German mine and Violet jumped overboard and somehow survived with a fractured skull in the water and swam to safety. Afterwards, Violet worked on the Titanic and on April 14th, 1912, she escaped another disaster on lifeboat 16. I mean, like the odds that you survive three times in a row is one thing, but to experience three of those in a row? Huh. And finally, number one, World War I soldiers. We have to finish on a grim note because this one is one of the most bizarre, in my opinion. When the First World War ended, the amount of British lives lost were around one million souls. The first reported casualty of World War I was a soldier named John Parr. And then after a countless number of lives were lost, the last soldier to die was a man named George Edwin Ellison. Now both heroes, resting places, are both in the St. Symphorian Military Cemetery, and they just happened to be 15 feet apart. And of course, this was not planned, nor were any of the entries on our list. It's just another bizarre coincidence that was discovered after the fact. Starting off this countdown, we have the 4th of July. The 4th of July is a big celebration in America. The holiday marks the signing of the Declaration of Independence. But did you know that a lot of US figures have died on July 4th? In fact, three of the first five US presidents died on this date, two within hours of each other. John Adams and Thomas Jefferson both died on July 4th, 1826. The fifth president, James Monroe, exactly five years later passed away as well. Seems to be a deadly date for presidents. Like, what are the odds? In our ninth spot, we have Barbary Shore. Barbary Shore is a novel written by Norman Mailer. It's about a character who rents a room in a Brooklyn boarding house in order to write a novel. Then a minor character is introduced and it's his neighbor who turns out to be a Russian spy. Well, after the novel was finished, Mailer's neighbor was arrested for being a Russian spy in hiding out in his apartment just like in the book he wrote. And he had no prior knowledge of his neighbor. Now that's freaky. In our eighth spot, we have The Omen. The Omen is a 1976 horror movie that caused a number of real life tragedies. As a result, it's been called a real life horror movie or a cursed one. A number of the cast members got into horrific accidents. For example, special effects consultant John Richardson got into a crash and his assistant, Liz Moore, was cut in half during an accident, similar to the death of a character in the actual film. 
That's not all. The screenwriter and executive producer were both on different planes that got struck by lightning on different occasions. It's just wild how so many cast and crew members experienced tragedy after working on the film. Is this a coincidence, or is the film actually cursed? In our seventh spot, we have William Shakespeare. More like William Shookspeare, because I was shook after hearing this. So, Psalm 46 in the book of Psalm reads, Here was I like a psalm. The freaky part is that this is an anagram for William Shakespeare. Arrange the letters and it spells his name. But wait, it gets weirder. The 46th word in Psalm 46 in the King James Bible is shake, and the 46th word from the end is spear. And how old was William Shakespeare when the King James Bible was first completed? He was 46 years old. So someone explain this to me, please go ahead. Try and explain this. Coming in at number six, we have the Jim twins. In 1940, a set of twins were put up for adoption when they were only three weeks old. They both ended up getting adopted by different parents, so they got separated. They were raised differently. However, both lived near identical lives. First off, we got their names. Both adoptive parents named their son James, but the boys wanted to be called Jim. So you got Jim Lewis and Jim Springer. Keep in mind, they lived separately and had no contact with each other. Gets weirder. Both Jims had a dog. They both named the dog the same. They named it Toy. In school, they both enjoyed math and carpentry, but had trouble with spelling. Both Jims went on to marry a woman named Linda. Then they both ended up divorcing Linda, and then they married again. This time, they both married a woman named Betty. So you're telling me that they both married someone with the same name, not once, but twice? What are the odds? Later on in life, both of them had a son. They both named their sons James Allen. They both drove the same car in the same color and both were chain smokers. In 1979, both the Jims actually met each other and realized just how similar they were. Like, this is wild. They had the same habits and everything. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with My Way. My Way is a beautiful song by Frank Sinatra, but it also might be cursed. Why do I say that? Well, at least six people were killed in the Philippines between 2000 and 2010 while singing My Way. Karaoke is a pretty popular pastime in the Philippines. However, this song is now associated with bad luck there. One time, a man was shot by a security guard for singing this song badly at a bar. Others were killed for hogging the microphone, and quite a few were killed for singing the song on repeat. Due to the repeated deaths, the song is actually banned from ever being sung or played in bars. In our fourth spot today, we have the license plate. World War I began after Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated in his car on June 28, 1914. The car's license plate read AIII-118, which wasn't a big deal until people realized that this was the date that World War I ended. November 11th, 1918, AKA 11, 11, 18, just like the license plate. Now, this car was placed in a museum in Austria and it sat there for almost two decades before a British tourist noticed the significance of the license plate. So literally World War I started and ended with this car. Coming in at number three, we have Catherine and Mary Kelly. On November 28th, 1888, a woman named Catherine Eddowes was arrested after being found drunk on the streets of London. When she was taken in by the police, she gave them a fake name. She told them her name was Mary Kelly. Later, she was released. However, that night she was murdered by none other than Jack the Ripper. The freakiest part is that that same night, Jack went on to kill another woman, none other than Mary Kelly the random fake name that Catherine gave the police, who is actually a real person and also got killed. How scary, but also how tragic. In our second spot, we have the Disney lovers. In the early 2000s, engaged couple Alex and Donna were looking through some old photos when they came across one of Donna and her siblings at Disney. While in the background of the photo, they spotted none other than Alex and his family. Alex is the boy in the stroller being pushed by his father. So not only did they go to Disney at the same time, they just so happened to be in the same spot at the same time and got it on camera. 
I guess that's how you know that your love was meant to be. Years later, they decided to take their kids to Disney and recreate this iconic photo. And in our number one spot today, we have the lightning strike. There is a 1 in 500,000 chance of being hit by lightning. There's a 1 in 9 million chance of being struck by lightning twice. What about being struck by lightning three different times? This happened to a man named Major Walter Summerford. He was struck by lightning three different times throughout his life and survived. Not only that, but when he did pass away, his gravestone was also struck by lightning. What are the odds of that? Like, did he piss off Zeus or something? All right, guys, that's all for today's video. Let me know in the comments below which one of these coincidences you thought was the freakiest. Also, do you have any stories? Let me know in the comments below. Coming in at number 10, we have Stephen Hawking's death day. Stephen Hawking was one of the most brilliant minds of our time and left a scientific legacy that humans will revere for centuries to come. It was definitely a sad day when he died on March 14th, 2018. Wait a minute. Isn't that 3.14? Aren't those the first three numbers of pi? Why yes, yeah, yes, it, yes it is, but wait, that's not all. Not only does Hawking's death day coincide with pi, it also lands on Albert Einstein's birthday and on the day that Galileo also met his end. Hmm, I guess great minds think alike. Coming in at number nine, we have Mark Twain and Haley's Comet. They came in together, they must go out together. This was something Twain said before he died. Mark Twain was born on November 30th, 1835, which was the same year, and two weeks after, Haley's Comet flew past. During his time on Earth, Twain was famous for such works as Tom Sawyer and The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn and many more. He was awesome. Twain was convinced next time the Haley Comet dropped by, that would be his time to go, and he was right. On April 21st, 1910, Mark Twain met his end, which was coincidentally the day after the comet passed by once again. Coming in at number eight, The Simpsons in general. One of the longest running TV shows in history, The Simpsons are notorious for somehow predicting outrageous events, including the president of the United States was gonna be Donald Trump. If you watched the episode with Donald Trump as president today, you would probably have thought it was just another comedic, satirical episode of a TV show to do at the time. But the thing is, they wrote that sucker 19 years ago. How on earth did they guess that? With the show running for over 30 years, themes occurring in the show are eventually gonna happen in real life, maybe. But this? They predicted a three-eyed fish, a circus entertainer getting attacked mid-performance, even the Ebola outbreak. I think we can safely put down The Simpsons as one large coincidence, considering the amount they've had. They happen so often that the questions of whether they are psychic or actually secretly controlling events, I don't know, these are just things we need to know. Like, right now. <laughs> These kinds of coincidences just need an explanation. Coming in at number seven, Catherine Eddowes and Mary Kelly. Jack the Ripper. That's, yeah, that's pretty much all I need to say to get all the cold case crime fanatics interested. Are you ready? This next coincidence is a lot darker. Catherine Eddowes was one of Jack the Ripper's victims, taken only an hour after Elizabeth Stride. But this is where things get creepier. That day, Eddowes was found passed out drunk on the street and was arrested. Once she was sober enough to go home, she ended up giving the police a fake name, Mary Kelly. That same night, Eddowes was murdered, and guess who would follow in her footsteps? A woman named Mary Jane Kelly. That's ridiculous. Like, that just makes me wonder whether it actually, I know they solved the crime, but that makes me wonder as to whether, I don't know, uh, Jack the Ripper was actually in the police force. How could that happen? How how can we explain that? That's just, that's just too wild. Coming in at number six, we have Royce Burton. Are you ever right in the middle of telling a story when the very person you're talking about like walks into the room? There are two subtle reactions. One, pretending we're talking about them. Depending on what talking about. Just pretend, just pretend. What? Oh, what's that? Oh, who's that? Oh, hey, that's what you do. And then the second one, you just look at them and go, oh, speak of the devil. Royce Burton had the latter reaction, though it was kind of cooler, when the very stranger who saved his life strolled in right as he mentioned him. Royce used to be a Texas Ranger, and one night while patrolling the Rio Grande in 1940, he got lost and tried to climb up the cliff to find his way. As he was nearing the edge, he almost fell, but then the hand of a man named Joe, like, reached out and hoisted him up. The two men lost contact when they both joined the war, and 25 years later, Burton had become a teacher and he was in the middle of the story when Joe strolled in. Not missing a beat, Burton said, I'll let Joe finish the story. And his whole class were like, what? 
These guys hadn't seen each other in 25 years, and apparently Joe had been looking for him, and the rest is the rest of the story you know. Coming in at number five, you know when you meet that special someone and you just know you're meant to be? Some people are so lucky, and this couple got a physical sign that they were in the right place at the right time. Melody Kloska and Matt Burr were married on August 18th on the beautiful Wisconsin beach. A week later, they took their vows, placed them in a bottle, and watched them go on their merry way as they let them drift on Lake Michigan, only to be recovered by Lynette and Fred Dubendorf. To their delight and surprise, the wedding date matched theirs as they were married on August 18th, 1979, almost 28 years earlier. If that's not a sign of forever love, then I don't know what is. Coming in at number four, speaking of signs, many people often look for the right signs when making a big decision or when looking for love. After going through a rough breakup, Esther Gracken wrote her name on several dollar bills and promised herself that she would only marry the man who brought one back to her. Wow, wouldn't you know, a few years later, a man named Paul dating Esther for a while, and he decided one day he's gonna ask her to be his girlfriend. That same day, as he was going to pay for his sandwich, he noticed that his dollar bill had Esther's name on it written in pencil. Weird, he was just thinking about her. He decided to frame it and save it for her as a gift. When she got it, she gasped, but didn't say anything until a few years later, because she didn't want to jinx it, when they were married. That was when she told him the story, and the two have lived happily ever since. Can't be explained, but it's pretty damn cute. Coming in at number three, Parent Trap. So first off, consider the chances of actually conceiving twins. About one in 250, so that's already a cool thing. But then imagine you pull a parent trap and discover you have actually had a twin your entire life, but you were separated at birth, and then you find out that not only do you look identical, your lives are too. This is exactly what happened to two men when they were reunited at age 39. They were both named James, they both grew up to be police officers, and both their wives were named Linda. Each also had a son named James Allen and a dog named Toy. Then they both got divorced and both married a woman named Betty. What are the chances of that? More like one, one in a billion than one in 250. Coming in at number two, we have Richard Parker and Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe, master of the macabre. This man's mind went to some pretty dark, albeit creative places. Some even say he predicted the future, which could be the only explanation for this coincidence. The narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket is one of his most terrifying, as it recounts the tale of sailors forced to eat a cabin boy named Richard Parker after being stranded on a boat after a shipwreck. People guffawed at Poe when he said that this was based off a true story, though there were none like it at the time. What is insanely creepy about the story is that 50 years later, the exact same event happened, mimicking the story in eerily close ways. The most ominous being that the boy the real sailors ate? His name was Richard Parker. And coming in at number one, Violet Jessup. Luck and coincidence often go hand in hand, especially for Violet Jessup. They called the Titanic unsinkable, but I think they meant her. This woman survived not one, not two, but three shipwrecks, including the aforementioned Titanic. She was either really lucky or a bad omen or both. Probably both. She worked as a nurse and stewardess on the HMS Olympic when it was struck by the HMS Hawk. She was on board the HMHS Britannic when it was hit by a landmine and the Titanic, and we all know that story. Though her lifeboat was almost taken down by the spinning propellers, Violet jumped out just in time and hit her head, but she survived, ending up living to age 83. How could one woman be so unlucky and lucky to survive three iconic shipwrecks? Hmm. Must be coincidence. Number 10, JFK and Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln and JFK have some uncanny similarities and it freaks me out. They were both elected to Congress 100 years apart in 1846 and 1946 respectively. They both became president 14 years later in 1860, 1960, and both died by a fatal gunshot wound to the head and were succeeded by a man named Johnson who, wouldn't you know, just so happened to be born 100 years apart. Add to that some other coincidences like them dying on a Friday, their family names containing seven letters, and the fact that they were both famous for their civil rights efforts, and you've got two presidents cut from an eerily similar cloth. So what does this mean? I don't know, but it sure is freaky. Number nine, the Jim twins. When two twin boys were put up for adoption in 1940 at only three weeks old, their adoptive parents coincidentally named them both James. Both men came to be named Jim 
Oregon for short, and that was just the start of it. The two would grow up only 40 miles apart from each other and live similar lives. They grew up without any contact with one another, and when they finally did meet at the age of 39, the similarities between their lives were scary. Both had beloved childhood dogs named Toy, and as school children, both had a proclivity for math and woodworking, but weren't great at spelling. As adults, they both were married twice, first to a woman named Linda, then to a woman named Betty. Now, when they had sons, they both named them James Allen. They were both smokers, drove Chevys, and even chose to vacation at the same Florida beach. Now, on February 9th, 1979, the Jim twins were finally reunited. When their fascinating case came to light, scientists saw how very valuable they could be to the study of reunited twins. They took part in a study conducted by Dr. Thomas Bocard of the University of Minnesota, who found that their medical histories and brainwave tests were almost identical. So too were the results in personality tests. How strange is that? Sounds to me that they were programmed the exact same way. Number 8. Double Slit Experiment In physics's famous double slit experiments, electrons are fired at a photosensitive screen through slits in a copper plate, usually producing an interference pattern that indicates wave-like behavior. Now, This type of experiment was first performed by Thomas Young in 1801 as a demonstration of the wave behavior of visible light. Now, At the time, it was thought that the light consisted of either waves or particles, but with the beginning of modern physics about 100 years later, it was realized that light could in fact show behavior characteristics of both waves and particles. Some have taken this to mean our simulation is conserving its resources and rendering certain things only when it knows we're looking at them. So does this mean anything? I'm not sure, but it is something to consider. Number 7. Mandela Effect The Mandela Effect is an observed phenomenon in which a large segment of the population misremembers a significant event or shares a memory of an event that did not actually occur. Fiona Broom, a paranormal researcher, coined the term to describe collective false memory when she discovered that a significant number of people at a conference she was attending in 2010 shared a memory that Nelson Mandela had died in prison during the 1980s. In fact, the former president of South Africa was released from prison in 1990 and was very much alive at the time of the conference. Now, This has caused an uproar on the internet with people discussing their experiences. For example, some people remember Mr. Monopoly wearing a monocle when he wasn't, Kit Kat with a dash in the middle, the Berenstain Bears or the Berenstain Bears, whichever you believe, and plenty more. Now, Is this an accidental glitch in what we're remembering? Was it done on purpose? I don't think we'll ever know. Number 6. The Goldilocks Zone In astronomy and astrobiology, the circumstellar habitable zone CHZ, or simply the habitable zone, is the range of orbits around a star within which a planetary surface can support liquid water given sufficient atmospheric pressure. The habitable zone is also called the Goldilocks zone, a metaphor allusion to the children's fairy tale of the Goldilocks and the three bears, in which a little girl chooses from sets of three items, ignoring the ones that are too extreme, too large or small, or too hot or cold, and settling on the one in the middle, which is just right. Earth exists in what astrobiologists call a Goldilocks zone, close enough to a star that greenhouse gases can trap heat to keep liquid water, but far enough that the planet does not become a hothouse. People believe that us living in such an orbital sweet spot is circumstantial evidence for a simulation. And let me say, if we were in a simulation, this would be the perfect place to keep us humans. Number 5. Glitches in the Matrix so with all computers, there can be technical difficulties, including glitches. Now, Many people believe there are real life glitches, proving we're in a simulation. These glitches are events that seem comparable to the effects of errors in computer programs or their execution. Some examples of these include objects vanishing and sometimes reappearing, people being seen by different witnesses at different locations at the same time, or not being seen in places where they should be, aka people vanishing, often for a considerable amount of times, often with multiple multiple searches, then reappearing and claiming that they have never left the spot. Also changes in everyday familiar objects and time slips and time freezes, where people interact with different time periods or where they observe all movement and noises cease over a relatively short or larger area. Now, Some glitches have been caught on camera, and one very popular glitch that has been documented lately is girls finding a nail that has broken off, matching their same nail color slash design in their room, but they are not missing any nails. So where did the broken nail come from? No one knows, but it freaks me 
out. Number four, doppelgangers. A doppelganger is a biologically unrelated lookalike or a double of a living person. As you might have heard, there are seven other versions of you in this world. Now, a study of lookalikes, unrelated people with faces so similar they could pass for identical twins, has found that such pairs share genetic traits. Scientists study 32 pairs of individuals with uncanny similar headshots who are a part of a long running project by a Canadian photographer to document these faux twins. The 16 pairs found by computer analysts to have the most similar features also share more genetic variants than the less similar pairs the researchers concluded. Now, that's not a huge surprise because researchers are already using genetics to predict face shape. The twins do not share DNA methylation patterns, chemical marks controlling gene expression that are shaped by our environment, reinforcing the dominant role DNA alone plays in determining our appearance. Number three, Stephen Hawking's death. Now, Stephen Hawking is regarded as one of the most brilliant theoretical physicists in history. His work on the origins of the structure of the universe, from the Big Bang to black holes, revolutionized the field. Now, Stephen was seen by many as the world's smartest person, though he never revealed his IQ score. Now, as Stephen himself would tell you, time is relative, but that doesn't quite explain why his death occurred on what many consider a fairly significant day. It happened on Albert Einstein's 139th birthday, Galileo's 300th death day, and Pi Day, March 14th, where the date reads 314. Coincidence? I think not. Number two, philosophers. Now, throughout history, some of the world's most notable thinkers have laid out their own questions and ideas about why reality may not be exactly what it seems. According to Built In, a significant number of people regard the simulation hypotheses as a modern offshoot of Plato's The Republic, or more specifically, the well known allegory of the cave. In a nutshell, the scholar's allegory features cave prisoners drawing conclusions about reality from the shadows of puppets they can't actually see. Basically, a prisoner who sees the shadow cast by a book may think and draw assumptions from that shadow about what a book really is, but can only learn the truth if he breaks free and sees the actual book with his own eyes. He isn't the only philosopher though, as another example is from 1641, when philosopher Rene Descartes presented the idea of an evil demon powerful enough to create an illusion that looks and feels like reality. So if these people thought this, and they have advanced technologies like computers, is it just a coincidence or is it more? And coming in at number one is Violet Jessup, aka Miss Unsinkable. Violet Jessup has some horrible luck, or great luck, however you want to look at it. In 1911, she began working as a stewardess for the White Star Liner RMS Olympic. Violet was on board September 20th, 1911, when Olympic left from Southampton and collided with the British warship HMS Hawk. Now, despite the damage, the ship was able to make it back to port without sinking. She continued to work on the Olympic until April 1912, when she was transferred to the sister ship Titanic. Violet boarded the RMS Titanic as a stewardess on April 10th, 1912 at age 24. Four days later, on April 14th, it struck an iceberg in the North Atlantic and sank about two hours and 40 minutes after the collision. She was later ordered into lifeboat 16, and as the boat was being lowered, one of Titanic's officers gave her a baby to look after. The next morning, Violet and the rest of the survivors were rescued by the RMS Carpathia and taken to New York City on April 18th. Then, in the First World War, Violet was a stewardess for the British Red Cross, and on the morning of November 21st, 1916, she was aboard HMHS Britannic, the younger sister ship of Olympic and Titanic that had been converted into a hospital ship when it sank in the Aegean Sea after an unexplained explosion. Britannic sank within 55 minutes, ending the lives of 30 of the 1,066 people on board. British authorities hypothesized that the ship had either been struck by a torpedo or got hit by a mine planted by German forces. Now, it's incredible that she survived all three incidents without getting injured, and she ended up dying at 83 of congestive heart failure in 1971. It had nothing to do with boats. We always do with our number 10. Meet Alex and Donna Vutsinas. They met at work and fell in love. Aww. She was from Florida and he was from Canada. Just days before they got married, Alex was looking through some of Donna's childhood photos and stumbled across this one of her posing at Disneyland with her brothers. Alex looked closely in the background and oh my god, he realised the man in the background was his own father and the boy he was pushing was him. What? 
what? That is unbelievable. They were from different countries, but somehow ended up in the same childhood picture together 20 years before they married at Disneyland as kids. Is that fate? Is that fate? I think that's fate. Coming in at number nine, we have the story of a 70 year old man from Finland. In 2002, he was riding his bike in a snowstorm in the town of Rahe when he was sadly hit and killed by a truck. It was a tragic and rare occurrence, but just two hours later, another man was hit and killed by a truck while cycling less than a mile down the road. That man was his twin brother. Police said it was unlikely that the second twin had even heard about his brother's death before he died the exact same way. The first officer on the scene said that when she heard the 70 year olds were twin brothers, it made the hair on her back stand on end. Blah, creepy. Next up at number eight, Dr. Peter Scott was the co founder of the Loch Ness Phenomena Investigation Bureau. Their aim was to identify the legendary creature known as the Loch Ness Monster. Now, Dr. Peter Scott wanted to make sure that whatever was lurking beneath the waters there could be protected as an endangered species, but first he needed to give it a proper Latin name for it to be registered. He called it this Nessitaris Rombop Terex. Now, the word came from ancient Greek and mean the monster of Ness with the diamond shaped fin. But not long after this announcement, a journalist with a bit too much time on their hands, I think, decided to unscramble the letters and they realized they were a perfect anagram of the phrase monster hoax by Sir Peter S. What? That's pretty mental, right? Come on. Can anyone explain that? Can any of you guys explain that? I don't care about all the Nessie pictures out there. You don't need to explain that. Just explain this one for me. Next up at number seven, we have the incredible story of the Jim twins. In 1940, twin boys were separated at birth in Ohio and adopted by separate families. When they finally tracked each other down at the age of 37, they found out that they had both been named Jim. But all the weirdness was just getting started. Jim and Jim both had childhood dogs that they named Toy. When they grew up, they both married women called Linda. They both then divorced their respective Lindas and remarried women who were both called Betty. They both had a son who they have both named James Allen. They both got tension headaches, smoked the same brand of cigarettes, drove the same model of car, and went to the same part of Florida for their vacation. And the list goes on. I think they're both wondering why the other one had to copy them so hard. Like, dude, can you just get your own life, Jim, and stop copying mine, Jim? Number six. In 1975, the Royal Gazette paper of Bermuda reported that a man called Erskine Eben had been hit and killed by a taxi as he drove his moped. What was crazy about this, though, was that Erskine's brother had died a year before, too. He was killed on the exact same moped. He was hit by the exact same taxi with the exact same taxi driver. And here's the real kicker. He was carrying the exact same passenger in the back both times. Whoa! I'm personally surprised the police didn't arrest that passenger because he might have been some sort of like genius murderer who kills his victims with like taxis. Next up at number five, we're going back to Detroit in 1937, where a street sweeper named Joseph Figlock was out, you know, sweeping the streets when a baby fell out of the sky and hit him on the head and shoulder. The baby had fallen from the fourth story of a nearby building and likely would have been killed if Joseph was not there to stop the fall. That was strange, but Joseph carried on with his life for another year. But then, while out sweeping a completely different street, another baby landed on him from a nearby building again. It hit Joseph on the head, and again the baby survived. This guy was like the strangest superhero of all time, saving babies with the power of his cushiony head. And now at number four, in the 1920s, there were three Englishmen on a train in Peru. They were all traveling separately and had never met each other, and were already pretty surprised that there were three English guys on a train together on the other side of the world. Then they introduced each other. The first man's surname was Bingham. The second man's surname was Powell. The third man raised his eyebrows in shock and announced to the other two that his surname was Bingham Powell. Whoa, the chances of that happening are mental. 
At number three now, we have the story of Michael Dick from England who wanted to get in touch with his daughter Lisa who he had not seen for 10 years after splitting up with his wife and moving away from his home. He tried everything but when all else failed he asked for some help from a local newspaper. They took this picture you're seeing now for the article. Amazingly, Lisa saw the article but before she could get in touch she realised something incredible. She saw herself in the background of the photo photo with her mother. They had actually taken a picture just there moments before and were walking away when Michael took this picture. The very person he was trying to look for after 10 years was in the photo he used to find her. I bet that's going to be a very important family photo. Coming in at number 2, in 1914 a German mother took a picture of her newborn son to be developed in Strasbourg but before she could collect it, World War 1 broke out. The woman had to leave the picture there and considered it lost forever. Then two years later she was in Frankfurt, over 100 miles away and now she had a new baby girl. Again she went to get a picture of her daughter developed but when she got it back she was quite annoyed to see that had been some sort of double exposure with someone else's picture in the background. It wasn't someone else's picture, it was her picture of her son that she took two years before over 100 miles away that had somehow ended up in a different store, marked unused and had been sold back to her where she then put another picture of another child of hers on top of it. <sighs> And finally at number 1, we're going back to 1899 where a man was struck and killed by lightning while standing in his backyard in Taranto, Italy. That's incredibly unlucky, the chances of that happening are very low, but guess what? 30 years later in 1929 his son was also killed by lightning in the exact same place. Okay. That's crazy right, that is crazy, a father and a son from the same family being killed by lightning in the same place. What are the chances of that? Well, 20 years after that, on October 8th 1949, a man called Roller Primada was also killed by lightning on exactly the same spot. He was the son of the second victim and grandson of the first. Incredible. I'm seriously wondering if that family was like made out of metal or something because nobody should have tracked lightning that much. Coming in at number 10, a leading Nazi was on a last minute vacation during the D-Day landings. A huge British wartime victory could have been very different if a German field marshal hadn't chosen that exact time to take his wife away. During the Normandy storm of 1944, Erwin Rommel, known as Desert Fox, decided to take his wife on a surprise trip for her birthday. He was a key strategist and a military tactic and had he been in Normandy, things could have turned out very differently. The scary thing about this coincidence is how different the world could be right now if the Allies lost the battle. Coming into number 9, we have the sinking of the SMS Captain Trafalgar. Ok, so this is some mind altering stuff, stick with me. The British Navy converted a cruise ship, the RMS Carmania, into a warship. They disguised this as an existing German passenger liner called the SMS Captain Trafalgar. This was in order for the vessel to escape detection. Now it worked and the actual Carmania disguised as the Trafalgar sank a German ship. Now this ship was the actual legit real life SMS Captain Trafalgar which the Germans had decided to disguise as the RMS Carmania. What? Maybe wind that back and listen again if you don't get it because it's taken me like 10 times to understand. This is a freakish coincidence. Anyway the sinking of the German ship was a huge setback for the German war effort and impacted the way that they moved forward. 51 Germans were killed and 279 captured. Captured. Who knows what they could have achieved in the war had they not been on board. Coming into number 8, Seth MacFarlane and Mark Wahlberg missed their flight on 9-11. Family Guy and American Dad creator Seth MacFarlane and actor and former rapper Mark Wahlberg were both supposed to be on planes involved in the 9-11 attack. Both men were scheduled to be on American Airlines Flight 11 which is absolutely insane. Now, Coincidentally MacFarlane's travel agent told him the wrong time for the flight and he was late, he missed the plane. Now this plane would have ended up being flown into the North Channel of the World Trade Center. Wahlberg made a last minute decision to fly to Toronto for the film festival instead. If they had died that day, the world would have had no American Dad, The Cleveland Show or any Wahlberg movies including Ted on which the pair collaborated together and of course no Wahlbergers which is obviously a 
travesty. Coming into number 7, we have Tamerlane's body and Operation Barbarossa coincidence. Tamerlane was a Turco Mongol conqueror and the founder of the Timurid Empire. He lived between 1336 and 1405, but his tomb was opened and his body exhumed by the Soviets just days before the Nazi troops launched a planned attack. His tomb was said to hold a curse that read, When I rise from the dead, the world shall tremble. Whomsoever opens my tomb shall unleash an invader more terrible than I. Now, three days later, Hitler launched Operation Barbarossa, the largest military invasion of all time, with heavy losses. This is a really, really, really scary coincidence. Barbarossa, of course, was an event that changed the world and also marked the decline in Hitler's stronghold. Coming into number six, we have the weird events surrounding the sinking of the Titanic. Now, the sinking of the Titanic was eerily foreshadowed in Morgan Robertson's The Wreck of the Titan. The story, written in 1898, so 14 years prior to the sinking of the Titanic, depicts scarily similar circumstances. A luxury ship, the Titan, is hailed as unsinkable. It then hits an iceberg on a cold April night and goes down. Sound familiar? Also in the book, the boat is a similar size and length to the Titanic. It travels around the same speed, and drum roll, there were not enough lifeboats for passengers. Is this a weird coincidence, or was Robertson a clairvoyant? Obviously, the sinking of the Titanic really did change history for, you know, ever. Coming in at number five, we have Lewis and Clark almost not making it through their expedition alive. Captain Meriwether Lewis and Lieutenant William Clark crossed the western point of the United States between 1804 and 1806. Their journey and discovery shaped modern America. At one point, the pair were captured by a Native American tribe. Their female guide, Sakagawe, discerned that the tribe planned to kill or desert them, but it all turned around when she discovered that the leader of the tribe was actually her long lost brother. Weird. She was stolen by a rival tribe when she was younger, and she only just recognized them then. As a result, the crew were gifted horses and allowed safe passage. What a coincidence. If that hadn't have happened, well, honestly, who knows? Coming in at number four, we have the savior that was Teddy Roosevelt's thick speech. Theodore Roosevelt was very nearly killed in 1912 when he campaigned for re election, but he was saved by a thick speech and a glasses case. In an eerie coincidence, Roosevelt placed the folded up paper and glasses case in his brain. Pocket. The exact area he was shot by a saloon keeper, John Flamming Shrank. He was saved by the contents of his pocket, and as he was not coughing up blood, he concluded that his lung hadn't been pierced, so he would continue his speech. On stage, he said, I shall ask you to be as quiet as possible. I don't know whether you fully understand that I've just been shot, but it takes more than that to kill a bull moose. Bull moose. Good. Coming into number three, we have the eerily weird circumstances surrounding the assassinations of President Lincoln and President Kennedy. So, the assassinations of Abraham Lincoln and John F. Kennedy have some very, very, very strikingly similar circumstances. Lincoln was the first president to be shot, and Kennedy the last. The pair were both killed on a Friday before a big public holiday. They both sat beside their wives, who weren't injured. Both were succeeded by a vice president named Johnson. Andrew was born in 1808, and Lyndon in 1908. Both had two daughters. At both assassinations, the presidents were with another couple, the male of which were wounded. Lincoln's assassin shot him at a theatre and then fled to a warehouse, whereas Kennedy's killer fired at a warehouse, then fled to a theatre. Both assassins were then killed by shooters with a cult rival. Just so many weird things. Obviously, both assassinations changed history forever, and like, who knows what was going on there? Coming into number two, we have the three cigars that created America. Having grown up in the United Kingdom, I wasn't taught a lot of the fine in detail about the American Civil War, so I literally just learned about this insane, world-altering coincidence while researching for this video, and I'm like, pretty shook. Basically, in 1862, Confederate Commander Robert E. Lee drafted a war plan called Special Order 191. Now, this outlined the movements of the Confederate Brigade over the next few months. This was every Confederate Brigade. He gave copies of these orders to his trusted generals, including the somewhat lazy Stonewall Jackson. Jackson then gave some copies of these to his commanders, even though he probably shouldn't have, because they probably didn't have the authority to have those plans themselves. One of his commands in turn, Daniel Harvey Hill, totally discarded his. He wrapped them around three cigars and then left them at a campsite when his brigade moved on. Days later, Union scout Barton W. Mitchell found the cigars. As he was about to smoke them, he looked at the wrapping and thought that they looked actually pretty important. It was. The wrapping then ended up in the hands of General George McClellan, who recognized Robert Lee's handwriting. With the plans, the Union's were able to stage a full offensive at the Battle of Antietam. Now, this was a tipping point in the Civil War that gave
gave the North the upper hand. Finally, coming into number one, we have a truly crazy coincidence. This one, this one turn of a corner changed the world forever. That's right, we have Franz Ferdinand getting shot. The spark that ignited World War One was a total coincidence. Scary, really, how the peace of Europe hung in the balance with such fragility. Basically, what happened here was that Austro-Hungarian leader Archduke Franz Ferdinand escaped an initial assassination attempt while he was in Sarajevo. A bomb was thrown under his motorcade by the Serbian Black Hand Gang. Luckily, or so he thought, Ferdinand survived, but in some final destination style turn of events, the initial assailant, Gravillo Princip, happened to be in a cafe where the Archduke's motorcade drove by again. This time, his car stalled and gave him enough time to shoot him and his wife. This was the straw that broke the camel's back in terms of the ignition of World War One, and what a scary coincidence! And this really did change the world forever. Coming in at number 10, we have that sinking feeling. How many accidents out at sea do you have to have before you realize that you should never go on a boat again? For whatever reason, there are some people who will never have a good time out on the ocean, so you might want to find a job that doesn't have anything to do with H2O. Well, Violet Jessup was working as a nurse in 1911, and she was primarily on ocean cruisers. Her first accident at sea was when the boat she was on board of crashed into another boat. Luckily, she was able to make it onto one of the lifeboats and get out without a scratch. Now, she probably thought that that was just bad luck. And what better way to circumvent bad luck than by going on a boat that was apparently unsinkable? Yes, the next year she got a job on the Titanic. Well, that stinks, and I think we all know what happened there. Again, Violet was able to make it out without a scratch. After that, you would think, I am never going on a boat again, but a girl's gotta work, so there was no slowing her down. The final incident was on board of the HMS Britannic. The boat hit a mine and was going under. This time, she she wouldn't be so lucky. She was able to make it out alive, but while escaping the sinking boat on a lifeboat, the lifeboat got sucked into the moving propellers of the Britannic and Violet received a serious blow to the head. But like I said, she lived, probably never to go out to sea again. Coming in at number 9, we have There's My Wife. When do you think you're going to meet your soulmate? Well, for some of us, it's never going to happen, so stop waiting and start getting really good at Call of Duty or something, because it's going to be a lonely existence. But for some other people, they might have already met the person that they're going to spend the rest of their life with, but they just don't know it yet. This was the very situation that happened to Amy Maiden and Nick Wheeler. The two of them are married now, but right before they were set to elope, they decided that they would go through some old family photos. Most of them were probably a nice hit of nostalgia, as most family photos are, but there was one that was particularly interesting. There was one of Nick on a summer vacation with his family when he was a kid. He was on the beach with his brothers and sisters, and in the background of the photo is Amy. What? the hell? How is this possible? Is one of them a time traveler who was sent back in time to rewrite history by falling in love with the other? Well, no, it wasn't that sinister. Actually, Nick's family was on vacation in the town where Amy grew up, and it just so happens that Amy was on the beach at that exact moment. Sort of romantic, but also kinda weird. Coming in at number 8, we have Anthony Hopkins needs something to read. We live in the golden age of literature. Anything you want to read, you can find in a second. You can just look it up on Google and half the time you don't even need to pay for it because you can just steal it off the internet. But things weren't always this easy. When Anthony Hopkins was cast in the movie A Girl from Petrova, he wanted to be the best actor he could possibly be by finding a copy of the book so he could have a good idea of what the movie was going to be like before he was in it. But he couldn't find the book anywhere. Randomly, he found it on a train sitting in an empty booth. When he was finally on set for the movie, the director of the movie asked him if he could borrow a copy of the book because he had left his on a train. That's a weird spooky connection right there. Coming in at number 7, we have the twin link. That has been a question for a long time. Do twins have some sort of neural link that lets them share thoughts and ideas? Does sharing a womb make you connected to someone forever in a way that cannot be explained yet by science? Well, no matter what your opinion is on this, this story is very strange. James Lewis and James Springer had a very strange thing happen to them when they were 39 years old. They found out that they had been separated at birth and were twins. Their mother gave up the two babies and they ended up in different homes. The weird thing is they both ended up with the name James. Then later in life they both became police officers. Both of their second wives were named Betty. Both of them had a son who they also named James and they both had a dog named Toy. Now in the infinite universe maybe this is just par for the course. 
reverse. And there's nothing going on here other than a roll of the die hitting the same number over and over. Or maybe twins are actually connected through some sort of psychic force. Coming in at number six, we have my buddy Umberto. All right, this one is super freaky and I'll give you the whole story, but for it we have to travel back to the year 1900 on the day of July 28th. This was the day before the King of Italy, Umberto I, was assassinated. I would never want to be king because it seems like everyone is just trying to kill you all the time. Well, on this day, Umberto went to a restaurant to hang out and get a little food and he met a dude who looked just like him. He went up and talked to this guy and it turns out that this guy was born on the same day as him in the same town. They were both married to ladies named Margarita and on the day Umberto became king was the day that this dude opened his restaurant. Whoa, that's a little freaky. Well, the next day Umberto was assassinated and guess what? The restaurant owner was also killed. Coming in at number five, we have the twin theory continues. We are getting even deeper into the wild world of twins. Is there some sort of connection or was our next set of twins just the two most unlucky dudes to ever share a womb? Arthur and John Moford ended up in a hospital at the same time. These guys were twins and they ended up in the same hospital and they were both having heart attacks. They would die around the same time. Dude, if I had a twin, I would be like, you better be healthy. I don't need my good heart crapping out because you love Doritos. Coming in at number four, we have Robert Fallon's best hand. Robert Fallon was on a hot streak in a poker game back in 1968. He was playing with some mobsters and it turns out that they didn't trust he was just lucky. So they killed him on the spot, accusing him of cheating. Now they didn't want to split up the money, but they also didn't want to stop the game. So they got a new guy to come in and play. This new dude was now on an even better hot streak and eventually the mobsters told him what happened and he realized that the guy who was killed was his absentee father who had been missing since he was a kid. Coming in at number three, we have Mark Twain pulls up Babe Ruth. Calling your shots comes in all shapes and sizes and with Mark Twain, it came in the form of calling out when he would die. That's a power of your own destiny that most people could never imagine. Mark Twain was born when the Halley's Comet passed by the Earth in 1835. And if you know the Halley's Comet, you will know that it comes around every 75 years like clockwork. When the next passing of the comet was coming through, Mark stated that he came with the comet and he will die with the comet. And just like that, when the comet passed, so did Mark Twain. Coming in at number two, we have the Tyranny Curse. This is one of the strangest coincidences I could find. This is all tied to the construction of the Hoover Dam. The thing is, the scouting and construction of the dam spanned from the 1920s into the 1930s and a lot of people died in the process. The first person who died was a guy named J.G. Tyranny and the last guy who died was Patrick Tyranny. The spooky thing is that Patrick was J.G.'s son. So their deaths were the opening and closing ceremonies for the dam in the darkest way. Coming in at the number one spot we have the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket. This is a famous book by Edgar Allan Poe and it's about a boat that sinks and then a bunch of people on board get stranded and they have to eat one person from the boat. A pretty grim story and it should be no surprise coming from Poe but here's the thing. 46 years after this book came out, a boat by the same name went down and the people on board got stranded and they were forced to eat someone on board who was named Richard Parker. Now the crazy thing about this is the person who got eaten in EAP's book was also named Richard Parker. Parker. Yeah, that's kind of freaky. In our number 10 spot today, we have the man who survived two atomic If you went to history class in high school, then you probably will remember hearing about the two atomic that the US dropped on the two Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. 90,000 people were killed due to the blasts and the radiation. But in 2009, the Japanese government confirmed that a man was in both of these cities during their and he survived both of them. Come again? Yes, a man named Tajumu Yamaguchi was on a business trip in Hiroshima on August 6th when he looked up at the sky and saw the B-29 and it dropped two parachutes. Before he knew it, he saw a great flash in the sky and he was blasted by the impact. By August 9, he was back home in Nagasaki recovering from the incident, only to endure it again. Even though you would probably think that he might not have lived long due to the radiation exposure, he actually lived to 93 and passed away in 2010. That's an insane story that makes you think out of 90,000 deaths, this man survived. He must have had a higher purpose. Coming up in our ninth spot today is more of a historical pop culture moment that scientists just wouldn't be able to explain. 
the discovery of the twins named Jim, a personal favorite of mine. You may or may not have heard of this story before, but personally, I think it's fascinating. In 1979, a set of twins that were separated at birth reunited at the age of 39. When they met up, they discovered some pretty crazy coincidences. Both of the boys had adoptive parents that named them Jim. Both of the boys loved math and carpentry and both pursued a career in security. But the coincidences don't end here. Here's where you start thinking, there must be something else going on that we don't understand. Are you ready? Both boys married women named Linda. Both boys then divorced their Lindas and both remarried women named Betty. What? <laughs> Shivers. <laughs> but it doesn't end here. They both had children and named them James Allen. <sighs> Mind blown. Apps like total shivers right now. <laughs> In our eighth spot today, we have the ship survivor. Imagine being on the Titanic and surviving that horrific accident. Then imagine being in another ship that ended up sinking and surviving that, and then being in a ship collision after that. That's definitely enough to make me never board another ship again and perhaps also have PTSD whenever I see water. That was the case for Violet Jessup, who was a stewardess aboard the RMS Titanic in 1912. She managed to abort a lifeboat after being handed a baby to look after. Years later, she was aboard its sister ship, HMHS Britannic, in 1916 when it had sunk. She actually almost died in this sinking as she was on a lifeboat that got sucked under by the propellers, but she jumped out in time. She was also aboard the RMBS Olympic in 1911 when it collided with the British warship. So to say that she lived quite the life would be an understatement. She actually died of old age in 1971. In our seventh spot today, we have the arguably fateful death of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. I say arguably because, well, just you wait and you decide. Yet another story that I hope you learned in history class, the assassination of Franz Ferdinand and the beginning of World War II. You may have learned that he died after an attack on his car, but you may not know that the bomb that was meant for his car actually hit the car behind him and the attempt failed and Ferdinand was able to get away unscathed. The assassins, we can imagine, were probably feeling hangry, due, of course, to this failed attempt and most likely hunger, as they then decided to stop at a nearby cafe for a sandwich. The Archduke, probably thankful to be alive, dashed off and continued on to safety when his driver took a wrong turn and ended up in front of the sandwich shop. The assassin saw him, shot him and his wife, and thus began the whirlwind of World War II. Makes you think that perhaps he was fated to die, or maybe he was just having a really bad luck day. <laughs> I would love to know your thoughts in the comment section below. In our sixth spot today, we have the deaths of Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. In 1775, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams became good friends fast. They worked together to draft the Declaration of Independence, and they also spent time together as diplomats for the US in Europe. They had a falling out in 1801 when Jefferson became president over Adams, and they didn't reconcile until 1812. On July 4th, 1826 though, the day that America declared its independence 50 years prior, Thomas Jefferson passed away. But what's interesting is that John Adams, in another state, was on his deathbed, only to say the words, Thomas Jefferson survives. And then, he passed away. Does this mean he saw Jefferson's ghost greet him on his deathbed? They both ended up passing on the same date, and not only that, but on the date that was seemingly their historical purpose. Coincidence? I think not. In our fifth spot today, we have the saving of Robert Todd Lincoln. You may or may not know this, but Robert Todd Lincoln is famously known as the son of the former US President Abraham Lincoln. In late 1864, Robert was traveling from New York to Washington when he found himself leaning against a stopped train. When the train started moving, he fell onto the tracks, only to be saved by an actor named Edwin Booth. When he later realized that his savior was the famous actor Edwin Booth, he made sure to thank him. It wasn't until much later did Edwin learn the identity of the man he saved, as he was the son of the president whom was shot by Edwin's brother, John Wilkes Booth. That's too weird of a coincidence for me. I guess perhaps if Lincoln's son had died, maybe Lincoln himself wouldn't have been where he was on that fateful day that he passed. In our fourth spot today, we have another weird coincidence revolving around Robert Lincoln. The death of not one, not two, but three American presidents occurred right in front of him. Highly sus, Robert. 
The first was of course his own father's assassination, President Abraham Lincoln. After his death, Robert and his mother moved to Chicago where he planted roots, got married, had children and created his law practice. He continued to work in politics as the Secretary of War under the presidency of President James A. Garfield in 1881. But while at a railroad station in Washington with Robert and a few others, Garfield was assassinated. Then in 1901, Robert was invited to attend a Pan American exposition in Buffalo by President William McKinley, only to witness his assassination. Apparently Robert has been quoted as saying that there was a certain fatality about the presidential function when I am present. Is there Robert? Or did you perhaps concoct the death of your father with your savior Edwin Booth and his brother John and then perhaps all these other incidences after? In our third spot today we have the Comet family. It is said that your odds of being killed by a comet is 1 in 1,600,000. So not very high. You're more likely to be hit by lightning and even that is 1 in 500,000. And so of course on top of these odds, no one would expect that a comet would hit the home of a French family named can you guess? Comet or commit. I love the French. <laughs> Comet. What are the odds? Probably in the trillions. Thankfully, nobody in the family was hurt and they now have their very own space rock as a souvenir. Life is so funny and weird. In our number two spot, we have the Civil War House. In 1861, when the Civil War broke out with the first battle of Bull Run, it at some point made its way through the garden of Wilmer McLean in Virginia. After the mass devastation, Wilmer decided to leave his home and he moved to a new place, Appomattox, Virginia. But of course, the war followed him there and actually came to a close when Robert E. Lee surrendered to Ulysses S. Grant at the Appomattox Courthouse, just only steps away from McLean's new property. Poor guy, he just wanted to live a peaceful, war-free life. Is that too much to ask for? Or perhaps he's psychic and he knew that peace would happen in this particular town. Hmm, who knows, but interesting coincidence. Finally, in our number one spot today, we have the very interesting birth and death of Mark Twain. Mark Twain was born on November 30th, 1835 in Florida, Missouri, the day that a very special comet was in the sky, Halley's Comet. The Halley's Comet returns to the Earth's vicinity approximately 75 years, give or take a bit, due to the gravitational pull of the planets that it passes. About 74 years later, Mark Twain made a prediction that his death would coincide with the comet's next appearance, just like his birth. He was known to have said that, it will be the greatest disappointment of my life if I don't go out with Halley's Comet. The Almighty has said, no doubt. Now here are two unaccountable freaks. They came in together, they must go out together. And he was right. He ended up dying April 21st, 1910, the day after Halley's Comet made its return. It was also a very special day as it was the first time the comet was captured on camera. Pretty awesome if I do say so myself. Starting off this countdown, we have the deck of cards. Now, I don't know about you, but normal deck of cards don't have number one cards. In replace, they have aces. But would you look at that? This odd deck had ones, which makes me very uncomfortable. I don't know about you, but I've never seen this before. If we're playing Go Fish and you whip out a one, I'm leaving, I'm sorry. Jokes aside, we have decks with aces because they can serve as the highest card or lowest. So it can serve as a one or more than one. That's why we don't have ones, according to Google. Don't quote me. So I don't know where this person got their cards from, but it just seems wrong. In our ninth spot today, we have the knockoffs. Sometimes brand name pieces can be expensive and we want the same or similar item, but cheaper. That's where knockoff brands come into play. Take a look at these cereals. They're so similar. Yet yeah, so different. So we got cocoa rice instead of cocoa puffs. We got honey nut crispy oats instead of honey nut Cheerios. Fruit rounds instead of fruit loops. Marshmallows and stars instead of lucky charms. Cookies instead of cookie crisp. And lastly, kids crunch instead of captain crunch. Now if I saw an aisle filled with those, I think I was transported to another universe. In our eighth spot today, we have the map. Now let's get to a serious one. In 1929, a group of historians discovered something pretty strange. It was a map from 1513 written on the skin of a gazelle. It was created by a well-known admiral of the Turkish Navy. Well, what's odd is that the map included Europe and North Africa, the coast of Brazil, several islands, and even Antarctica, which was not discovered until 300 years later. Not only that, but it was said that Antarctica was not 
covered in ice. The last time that occurred was more than 6,000 years ago. So this whole thing just doesn't make any sense. How did this man map a continent that's been covered by ice for the last 6,000 years? Maybe he's from a parallel universe or maybe the map is. In our seventh spot today, we have the stop sign. Again, another item that just makes me uncomfortable. Someone decided to create a lowercase stop sign and it looks like it's like stop, no just stop. Like it's too gentle. As a wise movie once said, no, 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 stick to the stuff you know. It's better by far to keep things as they are. Don't mess with the flow. Stick to the status quo. If you know what movie that's from, I automatically love you. But maybe this person was driving around in another universe. Who knows? In our sixth spot today, we have the Aumuamua artifact. Uh, hopefully I pronounced that right, because in another video I didn't, so now I'm changing the pronunciation. Let me know if I get it right, just be gentle, folks. In 2017, this object was found flying by in our solar system. Now, it's quite weird. It looks like a space rock, but it's not a comet or asteroid. It's too small and oddly shaped to be an asteroid. This thing is long. In fact, this is now the most elongated known space object. Not only that, but astronomers were shocked by the condition of it. Astronomers thought that the first space rock to enter our solar system would be a ball of ice and rocks like a comet. But this isn't one. No. Not only is it not shaped like one, but there's usually a cloud of dust and gas surrounding comets, and this object just doesn't have that. But before scientists could study it too much, it left our solar system. All we know is that the strange object came from another solar system. Or maybe a different universe. And that's why it's so weird and unlike anything we've ever seen before. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the Archless McDonald's. Imagine this, okay? You're hungry, you're driving down a road, madly looking for places to stop and eat, and that's when you see it. Off in the distance, you see two golden arches and you know exactly what awaits you. The one and only McDonald's. Except whatever universe this is in, McDonald's only has one arch. Like hello, it's not Nick Donald's, it's Mick. So stop, okay? Or maybe someone messed up with the designing this restaurant, I don't know. Also, since when does McDonald's sell just bags of ice? Like look at the sign. Bag of ice, one dollar. I mean it's a steal nonetheless, but still, that's odd on its own as well. In our fourth spot today, we have the Ulfbert sword. Now this is something scientists like to call an out of place object. And that's because the sword dates back from around 800 to 1000 AD. Which is shocking, since they didn't have technology to make such swords back then. Swords like this were made 800 years later during the Industrial Revolution. Not only that, but its carbon content is three times higher than other swords of its time. It also suggested that in order to make this sword, iron ore had to have been heated to at least 3000 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Again, they didn't have that technology to do that back then. So many people are perplexed. Well, there are a bunch of theories. One is that it was dropped by a time traveler, or two, it might have come from a parallel universe. One that is far more advanced than ours. But let me know your theory in the comments below. In our third spot today, we have Lost and Found. A number of people on Reddit have shared stories in which they have lost something only for it to reappear in a place where it's impossible to. So let me explain. So one man said that he was with his cousin at Home Depot. Before they went in, the cousin grabbed his wallet, but he didn't have any pockets, so he asked the narrator if he could put his wallet inside his pocket so that he didn't have to carry it around. He agreed and he zipped it into his track pants. After shopping around at Home Depot for a bit, they went to check out, but his wallet wasn't in the track pants. So they retraced their steps thinking maybe it fell out, but nothing. So they decided just to go back to the car and return to the store later. When they got to the car, lo and behold, the wallet was on the dashboard. Which is wild, because the cousin literally handed him the wallet and he zipped it into his pants. Now, one person believes that what happened was the universe glitched. And maybe in another reality, the man just left his wallet on the dashboard. Somehow, those universes merged, hence why the wallet was on the dash. Now, it's all confusing how this stuff works, but that's me explaining it the most basic way possible. In our second spot, we have the little dino looking figures. In 1944, thousands of little dino looking figures were dug up in Mexico. Only problem is that the pieces date 
back to 2500 BCE, a time when no dinosaurs were roaming around and people couldn't have possibly known about dinosaurs then. This is all according to scientists. So were there some other creatures that roamed the earth back then that we don't know of? Or is there a time traveling paleontologist out there? Imagine that, like Ross from Friends also being a time traveler, I love that. I don't know, or the object is from another universe. And in our number one spot today, we have the ring. Now this next individual has a similar story to the Home Depot boys. So for her, she was washing the dishes one day when she heard a clink in her sink. Her ring that she took off when she was doing the dishes had slipped and fell into the sink and down the drain. Now, it was just a cheap one, so she wasn't too concerned. It wasn't like her wedding ring. So she decided to just go on about her day. In the end, she forgot that the ring was even there. That was until a week later when she was putting on her shoes and felt something poking her toe. She emptied out her shoe and her ring clanked to the floor. So somehow, the ring went from being in her sink drain to in her shoe. Someone explain that to me. I don't know, maybe house elves are real. Starting our list off at number 10, Tyson Fight Glitch. All right, this one takes place in 1995, and it may be a glitch, but it also could be a time traveler. Who knows, both are always fun. This video is from a Mike Tyson fight, and while Tyson is of course the star, the center of attention in this entire video, there is a person in the audience who has us scratching our heads when we look back and watch. This fight, like I said, takes place in 1995, but when you peek into the audience, It appears as though someone is taking their own video on a cell phone or some sort of smartphone. This gadget that they're holding doesn't look like most cameras from the time and very closely resembles our smartphone cameras from today. With you know, the lens not being in the center but more off to the side. Imagine having this video on your phone in 1995. Like, hi world star, I'd like to deposit a video. It's gonna get me a lot of views, it's great, it's a really good one. Number nine, the reflection glitch. This video comes from TikTok, of course, and it shows one very confused driver in traffic. Yeah, this is more than fair. This man started filming in a car that was slightly ahead of him in the next lane because he noticed something was off. Again, I wouldn't advise you to pull out your phone and start filming while you're driving, but luckily we got this video. The man is in a convertible and his reflection can be seen in one of his side mirrors. That's very normal. But you can also see that the man is moving his head around in this car, which is normal. But what isn't normal is the fact that his reflection is not moving along with him. So. Could be a vampire, could be a shapeshifter, could be a ghost. I have no idea. It's really one of those things that you have to see to believe. Check it out. Number eight, plane glitch. Planes are wild. I have no idea how they work at all. They just, they stay up there somehow, okay. Sometimes they just look like they're floating on the exact same spot and it's so trippy. But this one here, this one is, is pretty weird. This video comes from Moscow and it shows what looks like a plane completely stuck in mid air. Like, really stuck. Check it out. <laughs> Imagine just casually driving down the road and then you saw this just frozen in the in the sky. I would think so many scary things. I guess the only appropriate response here would be to capture it on video because how else would you tell a coworker about this? You know what I mean? Without sounding crazy. I'm gonna assume that this is some sort of optical illusion or some sort of wind trick here, but it's just very strange to see a plane that is that close to the ground that isn't either ascending or descending. It's just kind of there. Is it possible that the clear skies made it more difficult to see the movement of the plane? I don't know. Someone help me out in the comments down below because I can't sleep. Number seven, another plane glitch. This video comes from a flight to Edinburgh, which is a flight that I've done many times myself. It's beautiful. The passenger began taking a video of the propeller on the side of the plane when they caught this strange glitch in the matrix. more than fair. This propeller is of course moving, or else, well, we'd probably know, but it appears as though it is not. How fun is that? It's a fun, scary optical illusion when you're thousands of feet into the air. This is due to the speed of the propeller and the camera's shutter speed, you know, being synchronized, looking a little bit funky. Now we see this often with helicopters, but to see it in a plane that high up from your point of view, that's a bit different. That's a bit more jarring. Number six, Yanni and Laurel. Remember this Yanni Laurel thing back in 2018? I'm still talking about it. It still f***ed me up. I heard Yanni for like two weeks and and then one day I listened back and then it was Laurel all of a sudden. And then my life changed forever. Couldn't go back. This got everybody talking. What is this phenomenon that happens? Is this a glitch in the matrix? How can you hear one thing and then a completely different sound moments later? The dress fiasco as well. Black and blue, white and gold. We see it often. What the hell is actually happening here? Laurel. 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 
While many believe that these viral illusions are proof that we're living in a simulation. And while these arguments are fun, they really just prove that we perceive reality in our own individual way. Everybody is living an individually perceived reality, so sometimes it doesn't align across the board. Sometimes I hear Laurel while you hear Lani. And now I can't go back, and now I always hear that stuck in my head. It's just Laurel. God, I hated this. Number five, rain glitch. This one comes from Paris, when a man decided to take this video one day when the weather was acting up. Anytime you film weather, you always know it's gonna be a bad time. First of all, it's not abnormal for rain to hit one part of a city while other parts stay dry with clear skies. I've been there before. It's trippy, it's kind of fun, whatever. But this one here, this one takes the cake. It's just raining in one spot, like literally one specific spot, one tiny spot is absolutely getting poured down on seemingly out of nowhere. But everywhere else is not. It's just a casual, nice day. Now at first I thought that maybe someone from above was pouring water, maybe, because that's what people do, I guess, in their spare time. But the video does pan up and you see nothing above this random rainfall, so we can check that off our boxes. If there's a scientific explanation for this, please tell me in the comments, because again, I have no idea what's going on here. I can't help you. All I have to say is hit the thumbs up, you know, all that good shit, but a scientist, please help me in the comments. Number four, manhole cover glitch. I'm not sure if these have the same name in every country or whatever, but this video is in reference to a manhole cover. You know those really heavy metal lids that go on top of holes on the ground that leads to sewers? I don't know, Mario stomps on them in Mario Sunshine, and then he pops up somewhere else in the city. Those. They're designed to be extremely heavy, so of course people can just waltz into the sewer systems whenever they feel like it, which is probably a good thing. This isn't the Victorian era anymore, we don't want to be down there. But this video would make it seem like otherwise. This video is very short, but it shows one of these covers just bouncing up and down as though it's one, lightweight, and two, there's air coming up from underneath it, just bouncing it around. It would take a lot of air to do this, considering the typical cover weighs 250 pounds. This reminds me of the end of As Above, So Below. It's a terrifying movie. That's, I don't want to see that moving around at all. Thank you. Number three, people frozen in time. In September 2019, a Buffalo, New York resident caught this extremely eerie and uncomfortable glitch in the matrix. A woman was driving past a park when she needed to take out her camera and record what was going on because it looked that messed up. It's, I mean, fair, more than, more than fair. A bunch of people in the park were just completely frozen still. They were just like, out of nowhere. And it wasn't like a group of people in the park who were doing like a social experiment or like some sort of weird piece of performance art, anything like that that involved a lot of people or something being completely still. I don't know, it's like a flash mob that doesn't move. Is that a thing? That's the only explanation that I can think of. A flash mob that doesn't dance or move. They're like three, two, one. The most boring flash mob on the planet. It reminds me of the scene in Logan when everybody's stuck. That's terrifying. That's a situation you don't want to be part of. That's not good. Yeah, do you see what I mean by this being the creepiest video ever? Everyone's just stuck standing where they are. What's going on here? Have you seen this? Someone tell me, I, I need answers down there. I need answers right now and photos of Spider-Man. Number two, are birds real? Apparently there's a huge thing going on right now where people don't believe that birds are real. There's thousands of people who are gathering outside and protesting against birds. I don't know what's going on. This glitch comes from a Reddit user called AmerXPOO from the time that they captured some birds behaving very strangely. So think what you want, but I think birds are real, whatever. I'll let you take a look at the clip first and then we'll talk shop afterwards. When I first watched this, I 100% thought that it was photoshopped. I truly cannot believe that I was seeing this because there's just no way, right? From what you're seeing, these are animals. From the coordination of the flying all the way to the ripples of the color changes, I thought this was fake the entire time. It's not. As it turns out, this is actually uh, perfectly uh, explainable. This is called a murmur, and it basically is a defensive posture that birds take. Truly one of the coolest things that I've ever seen, hence why I thought that it was unbelievable. And there are more videos of it that you can actually look up, and I implore you to because it's fascinating. This is like bird choreography. This is next level. People don't believe that birds are real, and videos like this make me agree. Yeah, fair. One point for the like, bird Gryffindor. Are seagulls real? Pigeons aren't real. Pigeons are fucking weird. And finally, number one, twins named Jim. Back in 1979, a set of twins were reunited. They were 39 
29 at the time, and this was of course a big moment in their lives, because for 37 years they barely knew of each other's existence. Yeah, that's pretty sad. When they did finally meet, the long lost twins had more in common than anybody ever thought. For starters, both had been named Jim. I spoiled that one in the fun title there. But both of these Jims, they loved math and carpentry. Okay. Both also had jobs in security. Okay. Their ex-wives were both named Linda. Okay. And they've since both married a woman named Betty. That's so many coincidences. I have no idea what's going on. Imagine meeting another you and he's like, oh yeah, I love knitting and Autobots. What are the odds? No way. That's way too eerie. That's a glitch in the matrix or an alien clone. Something's not right here. I don't know. I'm glad you guys found each other, but... Maybe you weren't supposed to, know what I mean? I've seen some movies, I've seen Black Mirror, that's all I'm saying. Starting off this countdown, we have the ladies on the bus. Imagine hopping onto a bus only to realize that it's filled with identical looking women. The odds of that happening are very slim, but alas, it has happened. This individual was on a bus filled with women, all wearing similar outfits, a beige trench coat and dark jeans. And they all had the same blonde dyed hair. Not only that, but all women were roughly around the same age. I don't know if a Karen convention was in town or what. Still, that's truly bizarre for that to happen. Coming in at number nine, we have the appearing check. This story was submitted by Reddit user BR Anderson. A couple of years ago, he received a call saying that he had some old fines that he needed to pay. If he didn't pay these fines, he was told he was going to be arrested. The total was 267 and 63 cents. This was around Christmas time, so the guy was really strapped for money. However, the very next day, he got a check in the mail for $267.63, the exact amount he needed to pay the fines. Apparently, he had overpaid for child support throughout the years, and this was the amount given back to him. That is wild. Like, the amount is same down to the cents. It's insane. In our eighth spot today, we have the doppelganger. It's believed that every person has roughly six doppelgangers out there in the world. Have you ever met one of your doppelgangers? Let me know in the comments below. Well, this woman did. She was at a Coldplay concert in Gothenburg, Sweden, when she found her twin. She had the same blonde hair, and eerily enough, they were wearing the exact same outfit. Round shades with a gold trim and a beige trench style raincoat. So not only did they look alike, but they dressed alike as well. In our seventh spot today, we have the time jump. This next individual has experienced a time jump on multiple occasions. He'd leave work and somehow get home in five minutes when the drive was 15 to 20 minutes. But he's not the only one that says that this has happened. Other people have shared similar stories on the exact same road. It even happened to his friend that rode in the same car with him. He noticed this jump as well. It's super strange. This road somehow like teleports them or something. I have no clue. They have definitely found a glitch though. Coming in at number six, we have the blue haired ladies. Now blue hair is pretty cool, but it's not common. Like not every day do you go out and see someone rocking bright, bold blue hair. So what are the odds that two women with blue hair and similar outfits appear in the same place together and they're strangers? So this woman was visiting the US for the first time when she met someone that was dressed identical to her while she was at the Met. They both have blue short hair and are wearing gray coats and yellow scarves. I'm gonna say this a lot in today's video, but seriously, what are the odds of this happening? Like the outfit, the hair, everything. Come on, what are the odds? We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the teleporting man. This next man and his brother were walking through the West Town Mall in Knoxville, Tennessee, when they saw this interesting man. He was 6'5", was carrying a staff, and wore a floor-length black duster jacket. The man was just a bit ahead of them when he turned towards the exit and left the mall. That's when they lost sight of him. Not more than 30 seconds later, out pops this guy right in front of them. He was now at the opposite end of the mall. Now, according to the narrator, this mall is huge. It would take at least five minutes to walk the length of it. But somehow, this guy exited the mall and ended up in a different area in 30 seconds. So what, he went outside and sprinted around the mall to the other entrance? It doesn't really make sense. This man glitched and somehow 
teleported. Or there's two of him. I don't know. Coming in at number four, we have the opposite twins. This photo I'm about to show you is of two strangers who got on the same train, but just at different stations. And they just so happen to be wearing opposite colors. Take a look. They got the same sweaters on. The guy on the left has an orange sweater with green hair, and the guy on the right has a green sweater with orange hair. Plus, it's literally the same sweater, just opposite colors. I just love how they match each other's hair. Like, it was meant to be. They better have talked and became best friends after that, because that is truly bizarre. And it was meant to be, I feel like. Moving on to number three, we have the radar detector. So this man was driving down a highway in Ohio when his radar detector went off. So he slammed on his brakes and slowed right down. And right over the hill that he was driving on, there indeed was a squad car running radar. And he almost got caught. So he was super relieved. However, when he looked over to the detector, which is normally on his windshield, he noticed it wasn't even there. In fact, it was unplugged and sitting in his glove compartment but it literally went off seconds before. That's how we knew that the radar was there. In any sense, this glitch helped him avoid getting a ticket. So there you go. Coming in at number two, we have the changing hotel. So this next family was driving to Florida to go to Disney World with their kids. They decided to make the drive instead of flying to save some money. But since the drive would take about a day and a half, they made a pit stop at a hotel for the night. However, the next morning when they woke up, they found themselves in their hotel in Disney, which makes absolutely no sense. Maybe that's the magic of Disney. I don't know. Like they checked into the best Western and the next thing they're at Disney. I mean, that glitch certainly worked out in their favor. They didn't have to continue driving the next day, but like they just somehow teleported to Disney in their sleep. It makes no sense. I am confused. And in our number one spot today, we have the frozen time. This next individual experienced a weird glitch in which time froze. So she was in her room when she decided to go down to the kitchen and make herself a sandwich. She clocked the time and it was 6.48 PM. She went to the kitchen, made a sandwich, got some chips, my favorite, and even poured herself a drink. This took her at least 10 minutes. When she got back into her room, she checked the clock and it was frozen at 6.48 PM. She even checked her phone. Sure enough, it was still at 6.48 PM. Then all of a sudden it changed to 6.49. So somehow time froze or she managed to get all that food made in less than a minute. Again, I am confused. This makes no sense. Maybe we are living in a matrix or a simulation. I don't know. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Have you guys ever experienced a glitch in the matrix? If you have, maybe I'll uh, shout out your story in the next video. Just let me know. Or you can DM it to me on Instagram. Up to you.